going deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change. The Ahmadi Muslims. That's all we got. young people today are said to be the leaders of tomorrow but what happens when they don't have the role models to become good leaders so i'm going deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change the ahmadi muslims they believe that through the game of basketball they can engage young people to do good so join me as i travel with the ahmadi muslim youth and dive into this unknown world as i try to find out if young people really have any hope for a better future here in belize Seeing Marbisov like speak um, uh, Spanish, right, with these guys in 10 months has been amazing. I mean, like, how did Hazur know, like, the guy that doesn't have any background in Spanish? Like, how did he know that in 10 months this guy was going to be explaining religious concepts in Spanish? And they understand these concepts. So it was insane to see, like, in 10 months anybody could do anything like that. This divided nation, this polarized nation, this racialized nation is now being torn apart again. Until there's honesty and justice, no solution will ever prove beneficial. Absolutely, this is the only answer for my country and, and for the world, to treat your fellow human kinds as you would treat to yourself. This is called the, the golden rule. The religion of Islam. deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change. The Ahmadi Muslims. That's all we got.
I'm going deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change. The Ahmadi Muslims. That's all we got. young people today are said to be the leaders of tomorrow. But what happens when they don't have the role models to become good leaders? So I'm going deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change, the Ahmadi Muslims. They believe that through the game of basketball, they can engage young people to do good. So join me as I travel with the Ahmadi Muslim youth and dive into this unknown world as I try to find out if young people really have any hope for a better future here in Belize. Seeing Marisab like speak um, uh, Spanish, right, with these guys in 10 months has been amazing. I mean, like, how did Hazor know, like, the guy that doesn't have any background in Spanish? Like, how did he know that in 10 months this guy was going to be explaining religious concepts in Spanish? And they understand these concepts. It was insane to see, like, in 10 months anybody could do anything like that. This divided nation, this polarized nation, this racialized nation is now being torn apart again. Until there's honesty and justice, no solution will ever prove beneficial. Absolutely, this is the only answer for my country and, and for the world, to treat your fellow human kinds as you would treat to yourself. This is called the, the golden rule. The religion of Islam.
Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Thank you for attending and welcome to Minaret Muslim Film Festival's inaugural online screening event. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Hibbut Mirza and I will be your moderator for the event this weekend. I'm a fourth year screenwriting student at York University and a graduate of the Broadcasting Television Program from Seneca College. I currently volunteer as part of the subtitling and translation team at MTA International Canada Studios. Minaret is an Ahmadiyya Muslim film festival named after the White Minaret in Gadian, India, where Ahmadiyya Islam was founded. The aims of the aims of the Minaret Muslim Film Festival are to promote similarities we share across religions and races rather than focus on our differences, presenting you, our viewers, with the true teachings, with the true and peaceful teachings of Islam. This year, Minaret will be screening the select works of MTA International, a 24-hour volunteer-run channel run by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Islam. The documentaries you'll be seeing over the weekend are curated to three themes, youth impact, community outreach, and pathway to peace. These documentaries were selected after careful consideration and feedback from a small panel of board, from a small panel of board members. In the future, we hope that Minaret will present a curated program of documentaries created by the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as well as MTA International. This weekend, we will be screening five documentaries, two shorts, and three features, so I hope you'll have settled in with some snacks. There will also be an interactive discussion with the filmmakers and cast during the discussion portion of both days. You, our wonderful viewers, will be able to submit your questions in the chat in order to separate them from other comments. In order to separate them from other comments, please write question in all caps ahead of your query. If you have any comments or additional inquiries, please feel free to email us at minaretfilm at gmail.com or across social media at minaretfilm. Please do remember to keep your questions and comments in the chat respectful. Before we start, with the first of our films today, I would like to invite respected Mr. Atawalavul Abbasi, head of the MTA International Canada Studios, to introduce MTA International and give the welcome address for the inaugural Minaret Muslim Film Festival screening. Okay, one second, let me check. Um, it should work now. Okay, 
one second. Can you speak for a minute? Yes, I'll make them. Can everyone hear me now, Fatih? Okay. Is this good? Can you hear me? Assalamu can you hear me? Okay, I think um, it's good now. Okay. I'm going to start again. Um, apologies for that small technical glitch. Um, it's all part of the work from home and uh, remote uh, conferences. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be upon you all. Dear students, staff, participants, and my colleagues, it is a great honor for me to have been given the opportunity to welcome you all to the inaugural Minret Muslim Film Festival. I am also privileged to be representing an organization whose works will be featured in this very first film festival at York University, Toronto. Muslim Television Ahmadiyya International, for those who may be unfamiliar with, is the brainchild of the fourth caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Mirza Tahir Ahmad. May Allah be pleased with him. It is the fulfillment of a grand prophecy given to the founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who founded the community in 1889. The channel was launched in January 1992, where it started broadcasting around the world from its headquarters in London, United Kingdom. It's a channel which spreads unity, love, peace, harmony, and the true message of Islam, as you will see in the documentaries being featured here today and tomorrow. From its extreme humble beginnings in 1992, the channel started its operation from just one office of 10 by 10, which was used as a makeshift studio and offices when needed. In contrast to the mainstream broadcasting at that time, this room was probably not even suitable to house the edit suite of one of these broadcasters. However, there was a vision and determination to be different from the mainstream media outlets to be considered a responsible broadcaster, one which isn't derived from any commercial gains, but rather educating its audiences about the peaceful teachings of Islam, contrary to what is shown in the mainstream media. Its aims and objectives were to showcase social equalities, humanitarian efforts, bridging the gap between how the West portrays Islam and the 1.6 billion Muslims around the world. Currently, under the extreme supervision and guidance of Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, the fifth caliph of Ahmadiyya Muslim community, MTA International has expanded its network tremendously, boasting a large state-of-the-art headquarters in London <coughs> and 15 other similar state-of-the-art studios dotted around the globe. On a personal note, I've had the opportunity at serving in three of these studios, the headquarters in UK, Germany, and now in Canada. MTA International became the first satellite broadcaster from UK to offer digital transmission to its viewers through its uplink facilities in Washington, USA. Those of you who aren't familiar with MTA would also be surprised to learn that it is a unique independent channel operating without any commercials or adverts. It is 100% funded by the community members who, generally, who generously offer financial sacrifices for the good causes that it has come to be known for. Another core operation of MTA revolves around <coughs> the heavy input of volunteers of both genders in all the 15 studios around the world. In fact, one of the documentaries you'll see in this festival, The Undiscovered Continent of Argentina, is wholly scripted, filmed, directed, and edited by a small team of volunteers from Canada Studios. To give a perspective in keeping it local, we have over 60 female members in our team 
who work in translation and subtitling alone in Canada. And across the whole channel globally, we boast a team of over 1,000 volunteers and only around 120 people are paid employees. As you can see, the majority of the workforce is volunteer based. With this force today, MTA offers eight individual channels to cater for various audiences in over 200 countries via 12 satellites. It is now also offered on terrestrial TV in many countries of Africa, including Ghana, the Gambia and Suriname, to name a few. The core ethics of Amdia Muslim community of assisting humanity peacefully infiltrates into MTA as well. MTA is continuously assisting other major broadcasters in Africa without any personal or financial gains or any expectations, but only to assist them in becoming stronger and independent studios. MTA has built studios for other broadcasters in Gambia, offer technical assistance and training to a major national terrestrial channel at Ghana, built a complete playout system and solution for another outlet in Africa. These are just a few examples of the many philanthropist activities it engages in year in, year out. As mentioned earlier, it has established over 15 studios around the world, which contribute towards this dynamic programming which caters for 26 languages of the world. It is also capable of transmitting 12 languages simultaneously with subtitles also being offered in over 12 languages, catering for all cultures and communities. In this festival, you'll have an opportunity at looking at the following documentaries that MTA has made in the last couple of years, being at the forefront of a responsible broadcaster showcasing extreme levels of equality and diversity. We look at a short film, A Cold Reality, which looks at the youth of the community who engage in humanitarian activities during the harsh winters of Canada. Belize and Basketball, a story on how Muslim youth in Belize are conducting humanitarian efforts by using basketball as a way of keeping young people away from problems of drugs, violence, and alcohol. At the corners of the earth, this documentary takes a look at an amazing and magnificent corner of Africa, the Ganvi Islands, where rich African traditions embrace and adapt to their acceptance of Islam Ahmadiyat. The undiscovered continent of Argentina, this looks at how a young missionary of the community from UK heads over to Argentina to set up the communities first mission house in the continent of South America. Pathway to Peace, the Golden Rule, which tackles cruelties, racial injustices, and why social equality is pivotal to the harmony of the society we live in. I must add over here that all these films above have been created on extremely modest budgets. But having said that, you'll see that they're easily comparable to the multi-million dollar documentaries being created by mainstream media outlets. Yes, we don't spend weeks and months in luxury hotels on locations with lavish five-star catering and hundreds of crew members. It is far from that. Majority of the time, the crew are just crashing out in the mosques of the countries they go for filming or you know other people's houses and guest houses. So with over 1,000 active volunteers, 120 employees, multiple studios in five continents of the world, programming roster boasting 26 different languages, eight independent channels broadcasting via 12 satellites. It is fair to say that since its humble beginnings, MTA has evolved leaps and bounds into a significant, powerful, responsible international broadcaster by the grace of God. Thank you very much once again for attending this film festival. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful experience. You'll have an opportunity at picking the brains of uh, some of the most highly talented, skilled filmmakers in MTA International over the coming two days. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my gratitude to the organizers of the event 
who have given the opportunity to us to showcase some of our work. Lastly, I do want to extend my invitation to those who may be interested in visiting MTA Studios in Toronto. You're more than welcome, but only once the COVID restrictions have eased. Jazakallah, thank you. Jazakallah, thank you for that introduction to MTA and to welcome our viewers. Uh, the first theme we will be taking a look at this afternoon is called Youth Impact, which showcases how the youth of our community have taken their place in the world and how they tirelessly dedicate themselves to the service of humanity and building ties with the communities in which they live. The first documentary we'll be watching is called A Cold Reality. This short film explores the state of the issue of homelessness in Toronto during the harsh winters and how our youth of our community are working to help them. So please stay tuned for A Cold Reality. As the clay black night spreads over the expanse of the city, most of us are fortunate to escape its frigid temperatures in the comfort of our cozy homes. For others, the sun sets too swiftly. The last one month in Toronto has been a harsh and unforgiving one in which eight people lost their lives due to Canada's severe climate. On any given winter night in Toronto, more than 5,000 homeless people are at risk of death due to harsh weather conditions. Even in Toronto, which is an otherwise thriving and progressive city, homelessness is an endless predicament that many people find themselves in. It's shocking to think of spending the night in weather that can freeze a glass of water in a matter of hours. And it doesn't make things easier when we discover that homeless shelters have a 98% occupancy rate each and every single night. So as thousands of homeless people rush to shelters only to be turned away, there's one glimmer of hope, a shelter bus that goes to them. I knew what a bus shelter was, but never had I heard about a shelter bus. So naturally, I was curious to see what it was all about. Uh, this is a very comfortable, warm bus. Um, the bus was converted into seating and beds. Um, the seating capacity of this bus is uh, 44 seats, which can be converted into 20 beds. Um, and you'll see here, for example, we already have one guest who's sleeping here. Um, uh, this can be converted into two beds as a bunk bed. And then at the top here, we have the storage area where um, our guests that come in can leave their uh, personal items here. The project is funded by Humanity First and the service is provided by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association. Working in unison has proved to be a rewarding experience. So, this, is, this is an amazing opportunity and uh, because this is a unique initiative, nothing has been done like this. Uh, there's not a single bus that caters to the homeless or the needy. Provide them with pizza, coffee, the water to drink, juice, stuff like that. Pizza slice coming up. They're so shocked that uh, why are we doing this? What is the motive behind it? You know, there's a bunch of young guys who are coming out at night time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the other day I came across one. Uh, Individually, he was afraid. He's like, where are you going to take me after I hop on the bus? I said, no, we're not taking you anywhere. Just come on in and enjoy the heat, have some food. If you want to sleep, sleep. So once he came in and looked at the atmosphere, and I think he spent the entire night. We started doing this over 10 years ago. Um, and we were simply handing out a slice of pizza um, or the juice and some warm winter clothing to the homeless. And every year it grew. We started off with a few volunteers, uh, four or five of us started. Homeless can be found in different parts of downtown. And they don't have easy access to the shelters as well, if there's space. So we said, why not take the shelter to them? I think we have served over 340 
uh, guests on this bus since, since the launch of this. So, uh, and the numbers keep going up on a daily basis. It's a truly innovative idea. And I was interested to know how they'd manage a three month long program of feeding the needy on a nightly basis only with volunteers. In fact, our requirement is about four to five volunteers, and there's been nights when we have 10 to 14 volunteers. So we have to send volunteers back home, but they want to come and they want to put their share as well. And over a period of three months, which the campaign is going to be running, we're expecting close to 900 to 1,000 volunteers. And this is overnight duty. That means these members have their families, they have their children, they have their work life as well. And aside from that, they're coming specifically at nighttime, from eight o'clock at nighttime to eight o'clock in the morning. And then they go back to work again. Yeah. How do you want your coffee? It's a double double. Double double? Yeah. Thank you. This kind of work is addictive. And we have seen a change in those volunteers. You know, sometimes to get them out the first time is a challenge, but when they come out and do this kind of work, it's, it's really sometimes to stop them that we have enough <laughs> manpower now. Thank you. Hello. Sit up here, we'll serve you some food. Always find us here for the next three months, okay? Mm -hmm. We are going to be at Mask Park every single night. Good. So if you feel it's cold outside, you want to get a place to sleep. My friend is in a wheelchair. Would he be able to come out here? Yeah. Right? We can put the wheelchair underneath yeah. in one of the storages yeah. and then he can hop on the bus. Oh, that would be great. He, yeah. I'm sure, yeah, he'll probably come this, all night there. Just put the stuff outside, come on the bus, yeah, yeah, you know, so I'm relax. Good. We have a couple of TVs as well. Uh, enjoy it. Spend the night here and then when you leave in the morning, make sure you take your stuff back, okay? Yeah. Just one example of how many people are out there. This lady was trying to find a ride and uh, she had absolutely no idea where to go to and I just happened to see her outside and I reached out to her. She was so grateful that uh, there's a, uh, a bus available and we were able to cater to her and try to give her shelter for the night. One thing that's really inspiring to see is how um, a lot of the people that have entered into the bus and we've served them, a lot of them know each other. And a lot of them also tell others about the service. So, you know, this um, lady was saying that, you know, I have a friend in a wheelchair, would they be allowed to access the bus as well? So they're always, a lot of them look out for each other as well. So, which is uh, really nice to see that, you know, that um, humanity is there. And it's just, you know, people in need who we have the honor of serving and helping them out. How do you guys usually approach? What do you say to somebody when you approach them? Just greet them and tell them if you need any slice of pizza or coffee. All right. You want to come into a shelter? It's quite cold, cold outside, man. You want to come in? Come on, let's go. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you please give him pizza and coffee? Hi, how are okay. you? Yeah, we found one more, Alhamdulillah. He had lost his jacket, so we went back to find it, but he was able to locate it, and now he's now he's with us. So he's gonna get some uh, warm food, some hot drinks, and uh, hopefully be able to, you know, relax a little bit. It's quite chilly outside. It is it is quite cold. You know, even wearing gloves and a scarf and a hat and a jacket and everything, you know, a sweater, um, still still chilling. We do a number of programs. We do food drives. In Thank fact, you. we are collecting over a half a million dollars worth of food drive. Uh, that's currently going on, it's underway. Uh, we just held a blood drive. Then aside from that, we have the shelter bus campaign as well. And then aside from that, we are reaching out uh, to senior care. Uh, we, in fact, uh, have tree planting initiatives. We have multiple other initiatives that this, this department is able to take on. And uh, we, in fact, on a daily basis, all we are doing is brainstorming what exactly can we do to reach out wherever their need is, and we can put our share as part of it as well. Now, it's one thing to simply hear about the various initiatives being undertaken by these organizations, 
But it was only when I got to interact with the visitors that I truly realized the value of this program. Pizza mango, my language same thing. Mango pizza. Mango pizza means they ask for pizza. We come from a dream style punch, dant, knock, ak, khan means eyes, teeth, and um, also mejao means I go. Um, two men means me, you, pani, water, ag is fire. Um, a lot of words are the same. One, effort. So comfortable, oh my god. I was wondering to you something like this, you know, honestly speaking, because I am myself a homeless on the street and I get frostbite sometimes, you know. It's very cold, it's very hard to get into shelter. Having something like this for even an hour or two to lay my head down and to have a warm, warm meal and have somebody like you to talk to and actually cares is very important to me in my life, you know. Because sometimes, you know, being in addiction and stuff like that and battling addiction in the streets, if you get very lonely, like you have nobody, you know. And like both suicide and suicide because of kind of like that. Do you know of people who have died due to the cold? Yes, yes, I do. My, my, my best friend, he killed out. He's a Polish guy. He passed away. He froze. He froze. Yes. He froze. 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 Because Maxim again refused him back. Because he was being a little bit noisy. They kicked him out and he froze to death right there because he was drunk. He lay down on the bench and he froze to death. I just want you to know how grateful I am and how, how I know how you guys came up with this, but I'm so grateful. I thank you so much for this, man. And honestly, man, like, I wish that there's more people that could get to know us. And I promise you, I'm going to let people know because it's something amazing, man. It's very, it's, it, you couldn't get better comforts. Like, you guys got beds, you guys got, you guys got seats, you guys got TVs, you guys got, you know, you guys are here, food. Like, it couldn't get any better, man. I appreciate you so much, man. I just want you to know how much difference you're making. So it's uh, 11.45 p.m. and um, some people just boarded the bus. We were about to leave when we, when we realized that some people actually were making their way to us. So they've, they've ate, they've had their hot drinks and now they're just resting. And uh, we're going to see how the night continues. And um, yeah, trying to serve as many people as we can tonight. So we're calling the ambulance now. One of the individuals who is on the bus um, needs the ambulance, uh, needs some uh, medical assistance. Uh, do you want to try putting your shoes on? Just uh, yeah. a lot of pain on his ribs. Yeah. The individual is saying that he was assaulted, and um, you know they asked him when he was assaulted, but he wasn't able to answer that question. He's just saying that he has a lot of pain in his ribs. And uh, so we're calling for uh, medical assistance to see if we can get him some help. Help is on the way, so just yeah, yeah, yeah. sit tight. Yeah. Try not moving too much, eh? Right here. Right here. Right here. This shows the need of uh, more care that needs to be given to the homeless individuals. And if we were not here today, perhaps this individual might have been more, much more critical condition than he is right now. At least we thank God that the ambulance is here. They're going to look after him. They're going to take him to the hospital. As the ambulance took the gentleman away, I understood that this shelter bus is a safe space for those in need. And beyond the food and warmth that are provided, the homeless are given a sense of belonging and importance here that is otherwise non-existent in their lives. And uh, I caught a great time after I um, was public skating on the ice rinks. Um, and I feel 
it's a place I feel comfortable at. Last year I was in a situation where I was lost in Belleville, there was no shelters and um, it was life or death and um, I wasn't conscious of it but I had to um, I had to fight someone to uh, to survive, so I'd be picked up by the cops and go to jail. That's what my thinking was, because it was bitter cold and no one was doing anything for me. How would you feel if we had many more of these kinds of shelter buses going around the city, picking up those in need? Um, I don't know how you used to do it, but um, you found me, so I'm sure um, I'm sure um, you'll find other people in need just the same. So sure, yeah, um, as much as possible. After spending just one night in the bus, I realized how fortunate I was to be able to head back to my home to my warm bed while many would remain in the streets, vulnerable to this bitter cold. And as it stands, homelessness is an emergency that not many are responding to. You got your shoes? Yeah, I got my brand new shoes. Look, my brand new shoes, my brand new jacket, my brand new bag. I'm so happy. Thank you very much, guys. I love you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. This shelter bus may just be one drop in the ocean, but is causing waves across Toronto. And with the right funding, those waves can reach across Canada. Okay, um, I just want to come back in and say that we forgot to uh, do the silent prayer. Usually we start our programs with a silent prayer, so I would like to request um, everyone um, to join me in silent prayer. And those um, who are um, not from the Amdi community or Muslims can join us in any form um, or way they wish to pray. So please kindly join me in silent prayer. Amin. Over to you, Hibbet Saba. Heavily armed police and BDF were visible today in the Tibru Street area in Belize City as tensions have escalated following the homicidal violence that swept the city over the weekend. Alcohol, drugs and violence. It's everywhere. Where in Central America, murders and gang life are part of everyday life and sometimes impossible to avoid. Young people today are said to be the leaders of tomorrow. But what happens when they don't have the role models to become good leaders? I'm going on a journey around Belize, a small country in Central America, to try and understand the challenges faced by young people here. If the kids have nothing to do, most, most definitely they will venture into doing things that are not or shouldn't be done. For more than five centuries, Belize was in the grips of colonial powers. And since gaining independence, they've been locked in a social battle triggered by the global drug trade. The drug of choice, marijuana. 
But now there's a chance to reform this nation. So I'm going deep within this country to meet the people trying to make a change, the Ahmadi Muslims. They believe that through the game of basketball, they can engage young people to do good. But with the stigma attached to Muslims nowadays, it's not always so easy. Ahmadiyya? I say, I say, they are from city, they are Muslim people. And I'm like, yes. And he was like, um, is it about terrorists? I said, it's basketball camp. We're not talking nothing about terrorists. Why are you thinking about terrorists? He said, but that's what Islam is all about. I said, no, it's not. So join me as I travel with the Ahmadiyya Muslim youth and dive into this unknown world where I encounter some amazing people, stunning landscapes, and experience some of the most dangerous places on the planet. A murder on Friday night has the victim's family members believing that the deceased was lured to his death. We're stuck on the highway outside of Hopkins, so whatever decision you make has to be made Im immediately. As I try to find out if young people really have any hope for a better future here in Belize. With one foot in the Central American jungles and the other in the Caribbean Sea, Belize is a small country full of scenic beauty and ancient cultures. With a population of just under 400,000, Belize is said to be the smallest nation in Central America. For centuries, Belize has been a closed-up British colony. But since independence, the world is slowly waking up to the charms of this country. People don't usually think of Belize as having a Caribbean coastline, but it does and it's breathtaking. Beneath the waves, the coral reefs of Belize is the second largest in the world and a haven for diversity. Yet, it's not all paradise here. Away from the tourist resorts and lush beaches, young people living here are at constant risk of crime and violence. There's not much for young people to do here. There aren't any grand shopping centers, arcades or theme parks, but there's one thing the country has in abundance basketball courts. Under the guidance of the current head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, a community known for its humanitarian work, the Ahmadiyya Muslims have started a fight back to help young people here beat their odds. Their plan? To empower young people through sports. So a basketball legal setup to engage youngsters here. Four years on, whilst working closely with the people of Belize, there are now 36 teams competing throughout the country. My journey starts in Belize City, where I meet with the missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Imam Navid Mangla. He's an Imam on a mission, after finishing his religious studies in Canada, he was sent to Belize to start the Ahmadiyya mission here. He quickly noticed that with more than half the country's population being under 24, there was a chance to try and move young people away from a life of crime and engage them in something more positive. We were able to meet the mayor of the city at the beginning when we, when we came here and we said to him that instead of we doing something and it might not be useful to you, why don't you tell us that how we can offer our services? He told us that one of the big problems in the city is, is the crime rate as far as the youth are concerned. So automatically, uh, one thing that clicked in my mind was the Amdia Basketball League. This is something that has been running in Canada for a long time, now in the U.S. So uh, we suggested to him that what do you think of this idea and he agreed right away. So we presented the whole idea to Hazur Anwar. And Azrus <clears throat> said something very interesting. He said that you should go ahead and do it. And even if the city does not pay, Jamaat should pay full amount and go ahead and do it. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community has only been in Belize for six years. But in that time, they've already established themselves as an outreach organization helping young people here. Through basketball, They've managed to bring together young people from different districts and neighborhoods who otherwise would hardly have any positive contact. We have grown over the years. We used to struggle. I, I could remember the first year we were struggling to have 10 teams committed. Now, fast forward to four years now, 
we're at 32 teams strong. I wanted to see for myself the league's impact in the community, so I arranged to meet with some of the players from the league to try and understand what difference, if any, it's making to their lives. If the ABL league wasn't here, right, and such initiatives, I'm sure there's other leagues or other sports that people play here, if such activities weren't organised by people, what would the youth be doing? Is there a lot of challenges people face growing up here? Well, growing up, peer pressure is what gets a lot of kids in trouble. And so they stop and they work on, they become, they become gang members and they start their own gangs or work for other gang members. Without all that happening, basketball is what's been helping a lot of kids because they're getting something else to do. ABL is a big reason to why Basketball is becoming alive again in the leagues. I see a lot of people take basketball seriously because it's a way to get free education. Mm -hmm. Education is expensive. I, I know that I'm trying to use basketball to get my way through education as well. If without leagues like ABL and other ones that do come to Belize, kids would still be playing basketball. They'd wait like when he said in the evenings and they'll go to their court, neighborhood courts and they'll be playing. But to what cause? They've been playing until they turn 20, 30 years old and they would have gotten nowhere with their talent. And Belize has so much talent. Have you guys heard of Akmadia before the basketball league opened here? Never, Do you ever. know what they were? No, no idea. Do you know what they are now? Yeah, yeah. What they did that I noticed that I, I really liked when they came to Belize is that they, they tried to take that stigma off of Muslims that they are very violent people. Like, I, I noticed a lot of things with people in Belize, they're, they're not very open-minded and they are a bit ignorant. But to be honest, you can't really blame people because on the media, there's yeah. so much negative things. To be honest, if I grew up in Belize and I had no contact with Muslims and from the stuff I've seen on TV, I would have the exact same view. Yeah. Right? Because I've never, I would have never seen how a Muslim really is, right? Now, you mentioned something interesting. You said Ahmadiyya preached love, peace, and all the good stuff, right? Now, that's all great on paper, right? But have you seen them practice what they preach from your encounter with them? I notice a lot of people doing this. They don't want to help you unless they're getting something out of it. Yeah, that's that, that's what I really like about the Amadia basketball organization because they're not really getting anything out of it. They're not getting any money out of it. The only thing they're really getting is that people realize that yes, they're a good organization, but that's just it. But they still do it anyway because they know we we care and we're ready to do the work and improve ourselves and try to make Belize look good in the eyes of other countries. Speaking with the players, it was good to hear about the impact that Ahmadiyya League was having in the country. After the initial success of the league, Imam Mangla is now holding small basketball camps all over the country to engage more kids. I love this guy. And for assistance, he's invited Yusuf Seeger, an Ahmadi Muslim from Canada, to help in this cause. I think Canada's on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing Yusuf did was walk through the seats of Belize to try and promote the camps with the hope of reaching new audiences. This was no easy task. We're the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we're, we're the peaceful Muslims, we're already spreading the message of love. None of this uh, jihad of the sword and all this negative stuff, right? Oh, you guys don't do that? No, ma'am. No, ma Born in Texas and having accepted Islam 10 years ago, Yusuf immediately saw the shared love for basketball as a way to engage young Ahmadis from all over North America. It started with my brother-in-law and me. We used to go and travel to countries. We called it Dean and Dunya, and we would find countries that had a Jamaat in it. And we realized really quickly that in Belize, basketball was life. Every court we went to, we'd go watch Marisol play, and he had a team at the time, and he sponsored them and had the, it was really cool to see all these guys with, you know, the Amadea logo and name on their jersey. And we're out there, and the, the neighborhood's out there, and they're all excited and stuff. And we're like, what is this, you know? And we went to, we'd go play basketball at night. We actually used to come down here. We taught our class just on the other side of downtown. We would be here every single night. Doing what? We would teach a class in the morning, we'd teach a class in the evening. And then we'd have to get back, so if we had a ride, then we'd catch a ride. If not, then uh, we would, we would uh, just catch a cab. He's helped bring 16 volunteers, organizers, and basketball coaches from Canada and the United States to help at the camps. Police Jamaat did their part. They did all of the groundwork over here. Whenever we showed up, they were ready to go. They had the camps lined up. 
And one of the most crucial moments was when originally we were gonna go to Belize City and just do Belize City, which would have been great. But when a mom stop went and turned it into a tour program and got us approval to go into all these different sites and to spread it from the north to south of Belize, that's when it was really over. And it was also great for us to sell in it too because guys were like, yeah, I'm going. And I was like, we're covering the country. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, all right, I'm coming. Let me pack my bag. How much money do I need to bring? And you know, everybody's mentality changed the minute that it turned into a tour. Over the years, violence has increased greatly in Belize and is now recognized as a serious economic and social problem. Persistent poverty and inequality have resulted in organized crime and the emergence of illegal drug trafficking. As night falls, the violence of the city strikes close to us. Six shootings take place in less than 36 hours. Belize City was rocked by two shooting incidents within hours of each other this afternoon. A murder on Friday night has the victim's family members believing that the deceased was lured to his death. The next morning, I want to know more about the areas affected by this carnage. So I've come to meet Kamal Nunes, an ex-police officer and now a guidance counsellor at the Gateway Youth Centre. This part of the city is so dangerous that troops regularly patrol the streets. Since coming here, I haven't seen any foreign tourists. These areas have been labelled as gang-ridden areas, as violent-prone areas because Obviously, they're at the back of the town. No, nobody really comes to these places. Even the tourists, when they come, they don't need to come here. So they don't see what is happening here. Citizens of Belize are casualties of a drug war that's going on. That fronts itself as a gang or turf war. They're just casualties. Kamal converted to Islam after being attracted to the humanitarian services provided by the Ahmadi Muslims in Belize. This made me wonder about how people in general felt about religion in this country. Our people generally are God-fearing people. They believe in one God. Any one of them you ask them, they'll tell you they believe in one God. And all of them are starving for structure and direction that they can't find and haven't been able to find in the church and haven't been able to find from even the people who are running the country. The Ahmadiyya Basketball League right here is becoming uh, big, uh, way out of, way bigger than we had anticipated ourselves. The media have taken so a keen interest in covering the league, with the games having even attracted regular live coverage on national television. Good afternoon as we are coming to you live from the Civic Center here in Belize City to bring you the U13 championship game of the Amadea Basketball League here from Belize City. I am Reynard Gabbat and I'm joined in the broadcast booth by our play-by-play -play commentator, Peter Lacey. With a total population of only 350,000 in Belize, the media is the best way to create a mass awareness around the country. Before the ABR camps kick off, I'm joining Imam Naveed and his team who are visiting all the major television and radio outlets to talk about the free programs they'll be offering. James? Yes. Tell us about this radio station. What's uh, this about? So this is uh, Crem FM. It's, uh, it's a station that we actually used to have a radio uh, program on, but uh, as I've become aware lately that that program is no longer running. As a native of Canada, James Sinclair is on his third visit to Belize. Alongside the Basketball League, the Ahmadi Muslims also offer a self and repair course, free to all Belizeans, which James teaches all by himself. This is my third year in Belize. Before I became a Waqfa Zindagi, that is a devotee for life, I specialized in business, specifically mobile communications. And that's something that I can offer to the people here in Belize, and they can take that and they can run with it and start their own businesses, and they can also provide for their families in the meantime. Whilst James and Kamal promote the camps at Krem TV, I rush across town with Imam Naveed to another live morning show hosted by Love Television. Okay, so we got some time. 
Whilst waiting to go on air, Imam Naveed explains how the national newspapers are also helping to promote the league. So, by the grace of Allah, our uh, scores from the basketball league are updated on the paper uh, weekly. So, it's right towards the end. You can see right here, MDA Basketball League, week seven results. And like I mentioned, uh, through basketball, the name of Ahmadiyya is going around the whole country. And there is definitely no doubt that Love FM is number one. We give you the most innovative, comprehensive, and entertaining coverage with the least commercials during the entire race. Join us on Holy Saturday, March 31. Welcome back everyone, welcome back to the morning show, the last segment of our show and uh, this morning we're talking about basketball which is in season, big time season right now in Greece and of course the uh, Madhya Muslim Jamaat Greece is big in promoting young people and young talent in the game, right? Am I right? Yes sir. Alright, well, welcome to you. Thank you for having us. Right off the bat, Imam Naveed takes this opportunity to introduce the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and its holy founder. Ever since um, he said that God has told me that your message will reach the corners of the earth, and it was um, that time people mocked him, made fun of him, that your own people in your town don't even know you, and now you're telling me that you're telling us that your message will reach the corners of the earth. So it was impossible to to think of that time that this mission will succeed, but. Trust me, sitting in Belize today, and Belize is small because I asked him before coming, did you know Belize was on the map? He said no. <laughs> so we're in... The morning show on Love Television reaches audiences in every district and town in Belize. So this is a perfect opportunity for Imam Naveed to get his message out. Last of all, just to start, this is, this is the way that we got our foot in the door, mm -hmm. uh, was to reach out to the youth and try and help the kids here in Belize and start a basketball camp. You're only seeing the beginning of the Amity Muslim Jamaat in Belize. Today is the first day of the first camp in Belize City. Before all the campers arrive, I meet up with head coach Osman Jabir from USA. But we want some of the players to play. Osman fell in love with the idea of the league after following his progress on social media. Back home, Osman's been coaching young athletes for many years as an urban youth coach. He's a strong believer in the game and is confident it can bring positive changes to young people. As coaches with basketball, a lot of time we'll say basketball, not only does it build character, but it reveals character. Part of the beauty of the game is you have to be willing to sacrifice and give up your ego for the betterment of the team. And I think the message as coaches that we give to our players of oneness and sacrifice rings home and rings true with Islam and Madiyat as well, right? As you progress as basketball players, Make sure you guys take your own responsibility amongst yourselves. We need to see leaders. Belize needs more leaders. The world needs more leaders, right? So don't, don't rely so much on them. If you see that your team is not playing hard defense, don't wait for the coach to say something. You can step up and say something, right? Like, come on, let's pick it up. The first camp that was offered in Belize this year was in Belize City at St. John's College. I, I was there myself, I think about 80 or 90 kids showed up. They were really excited to be there, they were really excited to work on their basketball skills. In our planning initially, we were very excited about St. John's because it didn't have some of the challenges that the other courts had, and specifically it had three courts on it. And so we were really excited about St. John's, but we were also worried because it was our first camp together that it was going to be a mess. And honestly, it went so smooth. Like it was just, it was almost just seamless. What's going on, man? What's my? Kidel. Kidel. John, what's going on? You guys, uh, we're looking for a couple more coaches for the camp. Would you guys be willing to help out? Nothing young boys, being a male myself, having grown up in this country, love more than competing. 
right? It gives you an adrenaline rush, it gives you a sense of belonging, it gives you a sense of hope, it gives you a sense of family. Who's gonna be a champion today? Is it the Walker? The ABIL camps are skill building camps designed to attract young people from all over Belize. More than just lessons in basketball, the camps offer a platform for young people to make new friends and engage in positive activities. Here, young people get a chance to feel good about who they are and what they can do. Playing any sport, I remember playing football as a boy and playing basketball when I grew older. It really keeps you looking forward to something and to have bragging rights most of all, right? To be able to brag that, hey, I beat this team, or oh, we beat that team, or man, I put a moves on this brother, this person, you know? It, it, it's really about building self-esteem and self-image and it only has better to get. I believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg, the beginning stages of this league. So inshallah, I think we're, it's gonna do very good things for our young people. In Belize, the Ahmadi Muslims are not the only ones providing programs to tackle the social problems of the country. While the issues young people face are varied, each organization is engaging people in their own way. And to find out more, I headed to the south side of the city, to an area notorious for poverty, drugs and violent crime. I met up with someone who has spent most of her life helping young Belizeans, Ms. Deborah Siebel. She's currently the managing director of a large non-profit organization known for working with the city's most vulnerable children. We have young men who have sat with us and told us just what their entire day looks like which includes extorting people on a daily basis for as little as $20, not $20 per person, but $20 for the entire group. Deborah says, with no money to feed their families, joining gangs and selling drugs are sometimes the only way out of poverty. So when a young man has to take on the burden and the responsibility of caring for a family, and we're talking about a young man who is probably 15, 16 years old, is now faced with the burden of providing, whether it's, it's a situation where he's told that he needs to do that or he just feels that he needs to do that because of he's the oldest in the family and he's seeing the, the situation that they're going through. So he takes it upon himself now to become the provider. And so if that young person at that age is not able to find employment, then you know we find that they gravitate and become part of these gangs because those gangs do provide for them, at least they make sure that they eat. Caribbean women like Deborah have emerged as a force for change in the region. Whilst men often fall victims to crime, the women of Belize have slowly become the backbone of the country. It's easier for women to be able to move across gang lines than it is for men. So you will find that women are the ones who are trying to, to make a living, trying to earn monies to support their families. Because due to the, the, the level of gang violence and the different borders, it's much easier for women to be able to cross those lines than it is for men. We decided to go and meet one such Belizean woman, Sister Khadija, a local businesswoman who recently moved back to Belize from the United States. So what is this place again? Yeah, this is the famous Swing Bridge. Um, it used to swing a long time ago, and this is where we bring most of our um, volunteer. Can I ask you a flyer? She believes the reason women have taken on roles as providers is because most men have fallen victims to alcohol and gambling. In Belize, you always see um, billboards for Bellican and Lighthouse and whatever function they have, a political function, mind you, will have alcohol, will be serving alcohol. There is a lack, laxity, there is a looseness. And um, I think that looseness is um, from their alcohol consumption. Morning. They get paid and they, um, they drink it away. And so of course the, the, the wife will be upset. She doesn't have money for her children. You know, bills aren't being paid. And you call this fun and it, <laughs> it destroys your health. It destroys your social life, your family life. Well, Alhamdulillah, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> and why do you feel Islam can address that issue? Because there's no drinking allowed in Islam. Sister Khadija was the first person to accept Islam Ahmadiyya in Belize. 
She now spends most of her time volunteering her services and preaching the peaceful message of Islam. You've heard of the Ahmadi Basketball League, right? On the news. During the basketball camps, Sister Khadija takes on the role of a mother, making sure everyone is well fed and driving the organizers to different locations around the city. And you got roundabouts. Okay, yes, lots of them. Roundabouts for life. Once you go roundabouts, you can't go back to this. Okay, building. come on now, come on, be nice people. It was time for us to leave Belize City and continue our journey across the country. <laughs> Since I can tell you lived in America, you drive too oh, good. Yes. You drive too good. Yes, the <laughs> level's way too high. You didn't learn this driving in Belize. <laughs> Yo, I love yes, this city. Yes, yes. Yo, it's, it's like the island in the hood had a baby, right? It's <laughs> called Belize City, man. It's just beautiful, right? It's tropical, it's hood, all at the same time. Love. I can't believe Yo. that. Nearly 100 miles southwest, we arrived in the city of Belmopan, the capital of Belize, for the next camp. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. I would like to greet you guys in a, in a Islamic salutation. Assalamu alaikum. Now, we use this round ball as a vehicle, as a tool to take you as a person from here, hopefully here. At the start of the camp, right. Coach Kaleem Griffith, a former professional basketball player, briefs the young campers. With his years of experience, he immediately captures their attention. All right, who else loves basketball? Raise your hand. All right, tell me the one thing that you love about basketball. Uh, that Speak loud, too. <laughs> somebody, somebody text you an answer, huh? <laughs> my name is Kevin Griffin, but my Islamic name is Kaleem. Omar Salam, which means silent warrior for the creator of peace. When speaking with Coach Griffin, a convert to Islam Ahmadiyya, he explains how Islam has instilled in him the true values of sacrifice and service to humanity. It all started when I ended up getting a text message from Brother Usman Jamil that there was a Ahmadi basketball league going on down here in Belize, and there was an opportunity for some of us brothers to come down there, give a helping hand, conduct basketball camps, coach these individuals, have fun, but bring the importance of the level of intensity and the passion that sports have to offer. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I did like some strength and conditioning and the energy was high and everybody came out the gates uh, firing. And uh, I think we also had built up a little bit of confidence because of, you know, alhamdulillah, how well everything went with the first camp. I was dying. I was giving the kids. Uh, I was giving the kids hell, telling them I was beating them with uh, with heart. I wanted them to go deeper than they had gone before. I think that's one of the things I learned from athletics. It helped me in religion, and in life in general. Was learning that whenever I feel tired and I feel like I'm about to quit, I have I have about 40 percent more. Yeah, I just my heart won't let me stop. Go. My lungs are telling me no more. Stay up. Your resting position should be with your chest on the ground. All right, we got four. You ready? One, two, down, three, down, four, down, relax. I saw the vibrant, I saw the souls of the individuals. Yes, this is a third world country, but they have first class compassion. Matter of fact, these kids here, they have more love for basketball and don't have all the resources. To whereas in my hometown of Racine, Wisconsin, I think a lot of the children there take things for granted because they have a lot of things of an abundance. But listen, this is police right here. They ain't doing this in Panama City. San Jose, Costa Rica, nope. Managua, Nicaragua, nope. Bogota, Colombia, nope. Even in my hometown in the States, they ain't doing it. You know what the kids doing? Snapchat, doing selfies, okay? They don't love the game like you guys do. Go! Go! Take off! Push, 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 push! Go! 
And so I was having fun pushing those kids past their limits a little bit, and they were excited too. When they're excited, it's a lot easier for us to get excited because we feed off each other's energy. And Brother Kaleem, just, he's an exciting guy. He wanted to push him, I'm down to push, right? And even if I have to go until I throw up, you know, and there's kids throwing up, you know, so what? I'll throw up, and then when, we generally when you throw up, you feel better and you keep going. And so it just lets us know that we can go further than we think we can. Yes, water for you, boy. See, this is what I'm talking about. Now I'm at training camp. It makes you throw up. That's what it's all about. Oh, it's all right, baby. I've it's thrown good. up so many times, you won't believe it. You know why you're throwing up? You're getting rid of the bad, and you're bringing in the good. I'm proud of you, Frederick. Good job. Good job. That's how, you, that's how we have to work on us. Yeah! We're excited. You know, our turnout was uh, way bigger than we expected. We were somewhere around uh, 40 to 60 kids. The kids have a great, have a great attitude. They're listening, right? They're excited to be here. They're having fun. It's a beautiful day, a beautiful court. I mean, you can't beat this ambiance that we have here. And uh, we're excited to push these kids to a level that they haven't been to. Hi, boy. Yeah. I mean, this is a level of human service that we're that we're compelling, and we're very vibrant at giving. I mean, yes, it is basketball. Yes, we have a history of sports. Yes, we have a history in our faith. But right now, the only thing that matters is hard work and unity. Because regardless if we're Muslim or Christian or whatever background, we are still brothers. And there's no need for us to hold on to something. These are jewels that we're giving to the next generation. Because by the time they are our age, we will be in our 60s and our 70s. So we're just maximizing potential. Watching the overwhelming success and the impact of the basketball camps in both Belize City and Belmopan, the organizers do not rest there. Instead, the volunteers increase their efforts and immediately take to the road, visiting five more cities and hosting basketball camps over the next three days. I think when we had first started planning it out, um, it was going to be, I think, a total of three camps, but all at the same location, St. John's College, and then Imam Saab had the brilliant idea of just taking this on the tour. So we're, we're getting a chance to take Jamaat Ahmadiyya to part, parts of Belize that haven't even heard of this, heard of us. So it, it, I think it's fascinating to see the different cultures within this country. Belize is a vast country. Huge areas are covered by mountains, forests and jungle, where the roads are often very poor. When traveling, we had to always be on high alert, as the intercity highways are often known for harboring robbers and hijackers. The country has always been a key hub for trade in Central America. Now it's been targeted by the international drug cartel, smuggling cocaine from the production areas in South America to use in North America and Europe. With nightfall, driving through the jungles of Belize became even more unnerving. Before coming here, we are told to be extra cautious, especially when driving at night, as Belize consistently ranks in the top 10 countries in the world for murders and homicides. As fate would have it, just as we were passing through the smugglers highway, the transmission of our car started to fail. Hi, we're calling the 24 hour service because we need your 24 hour service. We're on our way back from Punta Gorda and we're, st we're stuck on the side of the road outside of Hopkins. Outside of Hopkins? Yes. So traveling from Punta Gorda back to Belize City, uh, it's about a 500 kilometer journey. We ran into some car troubles. Uh, we didn't make it far outside of Punta Gorda and we recognized that we were having some transmission problems. We started burning fuel faster than we normally would and we were trying to come up with some solutions. There are no 24 hour gas stations between here and Belize City. Um, there are no, no service centers, no nothing. This is Belize, this is not a, a metropolitan where you can get service this late at night. But alhamdulillah, with, um, by the grace of Allah, we're all okay and uh, we'll survive the night. Uh, we're working on getting accommodation set up. Who's calling? This is Naveed Mangala, the local missionary. Uh, just one second. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu how are you? Good alhamdulillah, we're just outside of Hopkins. We are now stranded in a part of the country where murders and kidnapping have been known to take place. Can you check, but can you check if the, if the car is starting right now though? We're waiting, we're giving it a chance to cool down, we're praying to the car, uh, we're praying for success in our journey. So just uh, pray for us. Pray that we don't all die from mosquito bites or a jaguar jumping out of the bush. Everything's gonna be okay, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, just pray for us and... Uh... Through my experience in Belize, I learned that uh, God will put you in trials. 
and you can't get worried too much, right? So it, it was first um, a, a worrisome call that I received uh, from the brothers that their car has broken down, but um, we started praying for them. One thing that we were, were all worrying for was that we were almost all out of gas because the last gas station was in Punta Gorda and the next one was in Belmopan, so there was nothing in the middle. So we did not want to wait for them for long because we were afraid that we would run out of gas too. Everybody in the car. There's Jaguars in the bushes. Tell us, tell them that we're foreigners, it's not safe for and us. And we're, we're not from Belize. There's five people here who are not from Belize and we're, uh -huh. we're stuck on the highway outside of Hopkins. So whatever decision you make has to be made Im immediately. He's sending a Ford Expedition, uh, which is... With a quarter tank? Uh, with a quarter tank, so in the morning we'll be able to make it wherever we have to go. So Alhamdulillah, and they're coming to tow this vehicle. Okay, let's try and get to Hopkins. Left, right, center. After reaching Hopkins, we are hoping to find a place to rest for the night. At 3 a.m. in the morning, however, this posed a new challenge for us. With Sister Diana accompanying us with her husband, it wasn't safe for us to be in the open for too long. It's disappointing, but it's an adventure too, right? If everything were to go... Oh, you know what? There is a, um, a story about the, the third caliph, the third successor to the Prophet Muhammad Islam. And it was that on the entire journey that he, he spent with somebody, um, it went perfectly fine, but then in the end their vehicle rolled several times. And uh, the third caliph, uh, the third successor of the Prophet Muhammad Islam said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, our vehicle rolled. And when his companion said, why are you saying Alhamdulillah? Why are you saying Alhamdulillah for this situation? He said, because if there was no struggle, if there was no strife, there would be no blessings in the journey. The whole journey went without a hitch and that finally something had happened that would give them blessings uh, for the journey. So Alhamdulillah, the fact that our car broke down, it, it was reminiscent of that particular story that I had heard about the third successor of the Prophet Muhammad Islam. Our car didn't roll Alhamdulillah, but we're in a, we're in a predicament and Alhamdulillah, getting through those predicaments is, uh, is what, you know, is the, is the challenge that actually helps us pray more and accept God more. So inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll get through this together. Miraculously, our prayers were answered and the hire company came to our rescue with a replacement vehicle. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Having survived the night and with our batteries recharged, the organizers continued the remaining camps with renewed zeal. Got a little, got a little nap in the car, so we're ready to go. <laughs> we're just trying to feed off this energy. We might need a little jolt. Dave, it wasn't our largest turnout, but man, these kids just had like such, like, first of all, smiles from ear to ear. Anything we said, they were eating it up. Right, we're running drills. They're like, they were after those drills. Like they were going, you could tell they were going 100%. You could feel it from the campers. They were ready to go. Um, most of the other camps when you get to, the campers kind of on the side, just waiting. But at Punta Gorda, we blew that whistle. These guys raced forward. They were ready to go um, right off the bat. And the energy was there and it, and it stayed throughout the camp. This is to challenge you. Walking on being strong and being strong mentally. All right, when I say go, we're gonna go for 30 seconds. Ready, set, go! Let's go, Thomas. In my whole life playing basketball, this is the second time in Toledo we have foreigners come in and teach basketball at that level. We wish to have more, especially today, you have a lot of crime in my district. You know, so what I do is to try to keep the kids occupied by playing basketball. You know, so by working with them and keep them in a straight line, you understand a lot more from them because it, the problem starts from home. It's a social problem. The news of the ABO camp spread like wildfire in Punta Gorda, and this attracted the mayor of the city to come and see for himself what all the commotion was about. Youth initiatives and keeping youths engaged is of extreme importance to us here in Belize. And I certainly applaud you know, the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for taking such a huge footstep in nurturing the needs of our community. You know, sports is one way of teaching children discipline when it comes to real life. So it certainly promotes discipline among our youth. Salli ala Muhammad
دن صلی اللہ حبیب نا San Ignacio in general it, it was so beautiful like generally we want to be excited and get these kids going and push them like I said push them further than they're generally used to being pushed but San Ignacio was, was this outdoor court that was beautiful had rolling jungles in the background and I'm trying not to have a full Zen out meditation experience while we're doing doing the court thank God like some of the guys I felt like picked up some of the some of the weight as we were traveling throughout Belize you got a different flavor of of Belize and the, and the youth of Belize. I think that was one of the poorer communities that we had an opportunity to serve. What they lacked in numbers, they made up in heart and passion and I think gratitude. We have we have what we call raw talent in Belize City here. Yeah. And uh, we have coaches here in Belize City as well. But the problem here is that our coaches is at, it's at a certain level. Mm. And to go beyond that level, there's where the problem comes in. So what you guys are doing, man, is yeah. very great. And we want to, we want to, we want to applaud you guys for that. You understand? And we hope that, that this is just not just a one-year thing. Yeah. We, would, we would love for you guys to, you know, to just keep coming back every year. You understand? Because it's very great. You know, we want to thank you on behalf of, on behalf of the National Sports Council. Mm. We want to thank you guys. Thank you guys for this initiative. Wonderful. What's next? Uh, next, we're just going to close out the award ceremony and then we're headed to check out some Mayan ruins with the whole staff. We're looking forward to that. Oh, no. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, we're just getting on the boats. Let's go. I have no idea what this is. Look. I'm not going to. Oh! A trip to Belize would not be complete without visiting some of its world-renowned Mayan ruins. So we're going to Zunantanich, which is one of the biggest Mayan ruins in Belize, very close to Guatemala border, so much so that on top of the, the, the ruin, the building, you can actually see uh, Guatemala. Belize wasn't always poor. Over 2,000 years ago, the Maya civilization started from this region. Oh, wow! Many aspects of the Maya culture still persist in the area, despite nearly 500 years of European domination. Much is debated about what brought an end to the highly advanced Maya civilization. The most widely believed theories is that some type of climate catastrophe on a biblical scale drove the Maya to abandon their cities. Yusuf? Yes. So you just prayed. How do you feel? Alhamdulillah. First of all, what inspired you to pray up here? I was thinking that, you know, these people must have rejected the message of, uh, for the end to be like this. So I decided that uh, I would accept it up here. I know everybody wanted to do kind of a big group prayer together at the foot of the pyramid, but I really wanted to pray at the top of the pyramid. And just to kind of make a sign because it, those, are, those people are a symbol of a people that, that didn't do what they were supposed to do. And, that's the, and now they're, they're the proof that if people don't think that God will wipe a people out, like he definitely will. And he left enough just so they're there. And so, yeah, I wanted to make a point of trying to do what he has told us to do. And so that's why I wanted to pray on top of it. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful things about this trip um, every namaz we do, they, they share hadith and, and um, sayings of the Promised Messiah with us. So it's been tarbiyat for us too. Um, and these missionaries are like those mountains. They have this wealth of knowledge and they're giving it to them. And in a small way, I think us as coaches, we are mountains or, or hills. And I, the water that we're giving to the players in Belize in each camp, inshallah, is nourishing them somehow, some way. And maybe one day, uh, we'll get converts out of here in Belize. Inshallah. What the medicine also says on the truck at the back of the van. Is that? You see what it says there? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you got that in the chat? Ye brethren, ye hear king to the voice of heaven about Messiah. After a week of touring the country, I end my journey at the same place where I started, in Belize City. Once again, it's a very exciting morning here in Belize City as we are coming to you live from the St. John's Auditorium here. I've been invited to a star-studded all-star game by Imam Naveed, which has been broadcast today 
for the National Television Channel of Belize. Now let's talk a little bit about what is happening here this morning. It's all-star morning for the Amadeya Basketball Club and I know that our television viewers, they will be exciting um, for what is happening here this morning, but maybe you can give them a, a brief detail of what the all-star morning looks like. When I say all-star, it basically means that the best kids that we can find in each team, two or three according to the division, we have um, uh, pick them and they'll be showcasing their, their talent today. The mayor of the city is also in attendance, along with the Grammy award-winning rapper Shine Burrow, who also happens to be the son of the prime minister of the country. This is Shine live from Belize. Welcome to Amadea Basketball League. The future is bright for Belize, and I think um, if we had more people like uh, Amadea, uh, both foreign and domestic, uh, banding together for the betterment of the development of the human beings in Belize, you know, we'll be able to uh, maximize our full potential. And I didn't know that Amadea Group has been doing wonderful work in our community. We, we have had a lot of negativity in our community with crime, with violence, in the, in the poverty-stricken areas. The Amadea Group certainly has played a significant role in alleviating some of those crimes, some of those violence in our community. And I certainly welcome it as the new mayor of the city and I certainly want to enhance the program that you all are doing. I do appreciate uh, Amadea's uh, contributions, not just from a vantage point of athleticism and supporting the sports and the youth, but it's a bridge uh, between God uh, religion, spirituality, which is missing in the world. We, we, you know, we've, we've removed uh, the creator of the universe from our lives, and we need that back uh, because there's nothing uh, that could be sustained without you know, the omnipotent, all-powerful creator of the universe. <laughs> Just like that, it was all over. All the hard work put in by Imam Navid and his team finally paid off. They managed to bring young people together from all over Belize through the game of basketball with their slogan of love for all, hatred for none. We that were on this trip were just fortunate enough to use our passion and our energy for this game as just a means and a vehicle to spread this message to the corners of the earth. Inshallah, we did the best that we can do. Inshallah, you'll be next. Inshallah, there's somebody watching this that will be inspired by this documentary to start the next soccer camp in Africa or Asia or any other thing that could come to their mind. Inshallah, we sparked it. We're doing this because we love the sport, but through sport, we're spreading the word of Ahmadiyya. Just before Juma today, when I came here, a, uh, a boy came to me and he, say, and he said in Spanish, I case Ahmadiyya. What is Ahmadiyya? Right? And I think that alone, we have served our purpose of being here. Some one person has remembered the name of Ahmadiyya. I think we have done our job here today. So this is the, you have no idea how much impact you have made just by coming here for five, six days. The, these people who have learned anything about Ahmadiyya, they will be, the, you know, you will get the reward for it for the rest of your lives because you were the pioneer who came to these cities and were able to spread the word of Ahmadiyya for the first time ever. And trust me, um, you will get the reward for it. And I pray that may Allah uh, uh, reward all of us abundantly. Jazakumullah. <laughs> So it's all over, how are you feeling? 
I'm the, I mean, I feel great, but I also feel like, uh, I feel like we have so much more to do. You know, if anything, like, I don't feel like mission accomplished. I feel like mission started. Ahmadiyad Zindabad. Ahmadiyad Zindabad. What are your impressions about the Ahmadiyya community now? Well, my impressions about the Ahmadiyya community. First off, I've, I've been with you guys since we've started this journey. And, um... I had no idea that you guys pray so much. Assalamualaikum and welcome back. Um, my apologies for the audio issues. Hopefully now everything's been sorted. Um, thank you for joining us. Before we get to the last two documentaries of the evening, just a reminder that you, our viewers, can leave your comments and questions in the chat. If you'd like your questions to be asked during our interactive discussion, please make sure to type the question well, the word question, in all caps, in front of your query. So our next documentaries are going to be on the topic of community outreach, which includes mission building and the outreach initiatives of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in other countries as members work towards eradicating the negative me media attention directed at Islam. Our first film on this topic is called At the Corners of the Earth, Ganvier. This beautiful film covers the remote village of Ganvier steeped in rich African tradition and their journey to embrace and adapt to the teachings of Islam. So without further ado, this is At the Corners of the Earth, Ganvier. Afuna Simbinum Lodevindela Kaimwe. Did you know our species is an African one? 70,000 years ago, our ancestors decided to migrate and spread far and wide to the corners of the earth, and we're still doing so today. As a result, we have become an urban species, pouring into every square inch of land and even water. Welcome to Gambia, a sprawling town built on water. These people have brought 300 years of culture and religion from land and have been adapting successfully to the realities of modern day life and religion in ways that you in the so-called developed world couldn't even imagine. They're resourceful determined and unbelievably resilient. These people can show you that a little bit of chaos is not always a bad thing in this little corner of the earth. Situated on the shores of Benin lies Godunu one of the most rapidly growing cities of West Africa. Previously, this was known as the Slave Coast, the departure point for African slaves as they were shipped across the Atlantic. Now, Cotonou is a rapidly advancing hub, bursting with more than a million people in a small stretch of land and growing. Almost 400 years ago, as the four warriors were rounding up local tribes for sale to Portuguese slave traders, a rather ingenious king decided that the best way for his people to survive 
would be to relocate the Dauphin tribe to the middle of Lake Noku. Little did the king know that he just laid the foundation for Africa's oldest and largest water village. Several miles from the nearest shoreline lies Africa's answer to Venice, the village of Gambia. Little has changed in the last 400 years. The sheer will and resilience of the Dauphin people has hardly washed away. Now Gambier is an intricate and prosperous culture of more than 30,000 water inhabitants residing in their stilt houses without any running water or electricity. Yes, these are a tough bunch. They've shown the world that with a little creativity and a dash of raw African courage and camaraderie, Christians, Muslims and Voodoo can quite happily coexist for many centuries. You can see every people here, no matter how small or big, ladies or men, they are all moving with boats. Because this town in water is it a water town we can see so every time whatever they need they must move with boats most of them they are voodoo people and how to say and also some of them are christian catholic and also they remain are muslims and now alhamdulillah we are having more than 200 ahmadi muslim in this town Imam Sikiru is a local missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, a rapidly growing denomination of Muslims all over the world that believe in the Messiah. And for the past three years, he has been coming regularly to Gambia to tend to his flock of more than 200 Ahmadi Muslims that settled here more than 50 years ago. This is our mosque, Mosque Ahmadiyya in Gambia. So this is a very beautiful mosque. We can't find how to say, in the water like that. So this one is our president. President, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ah, how are you? Ah. How's everything? Good. Ah. good, good. You see, this is my president. He is the president of Jamaat of Gambi. He's a very kind person, very, very, how to say, righteous person. Since his beginning, his, since his childhood, he starts serving Jamaat. Hassan Hakume was a young teenager when his Nigerian father left his ancestral Vodun religion for Islam and migrated west with his family to Gambia and constructed this mosque. Five decades on, Hassan is the president of his local Ahmadiyya community of Gambia, tending to the daily spiritual needs of the young and managing his father's legacy, the Ahmadiyya Mosque of Gambia, with his wife, Abiba, or Mama, as she's affectionately called. Baba <laughs> Living on the water and commuting on boats is all fun, 
but it does reduce employment prospects. The waterways aren't exactly bursting with office space and employment opportunities. So the main source of food on the table is fishing. Life on the lake and its little islands isn't too different from what you're used to, you know. Dental hygiene is taken quite seriously in Gambia. In this nice villa, the whole shack is that one. This is Ibrahim. I say, Mama, to lose my own name, I'm not going to. Fatah also moved to Gambia from Nigeria at a young age. And now with his wife, sister and three children, putting food on the table is always first on the day's agenda. Fatah left Christianity only two years ago and has now found peace and solace in Islam Ahmadiyya and has rapidly flourished in his newfound faith. He's become the head of the local Ahmadiyya Muslim youth organization of Gambia. <laughs> Most of the fishing on Lake Noku happens via the ancient tradition of Akaja, a complicated network of underwater fencing to corral and farm fish. These Akaja farms spread for miles, as far as the eye can see, and is a reliable, no fuss way to get your hands on some tender fish. <laughs> Ready. <laughs> Yeah, 
Mais for residents of Gambia, fishing is a science and a way of life. You'll be hard pressed to see someone not fishing. With every adult and young boy fishing their hearts out, some feel the fish economy is a little saturated and so turn to more creative methods for earning cash. Other than fishing, a possible lucrative method is practiced by the sand boys of Gambia. Leon has been collecting sand the old-fashioned way, by hand, in a bucket, from the bottom of the lake since childhood. With Cotonou becoming a bustling metropolis day by day and new buildings popping up on every block, Leon can get a decent amount for the high quality sharp sand so essential to the building work on the mainland. In the man be any nehia, Boka warrior, any nehia. Now, clearing centuries old muck from sand buckets may not be for everyone, but pretty much everything takes place on water. Goods are brought in from market. Super boat markets offer everything a water village house needs. There's medical and maternity clinics, barbers, tailors restaurants, games arcade, cinema, and even schools for the village children. And home deliveries were perfected in Gambia decades before the large Western supermarkets caught on. <laughs> Sophia is one of the many door-to-door -door food delivery merchants of Gambia. And when she's not serving the hungry customers of the village, she's busy teaching the importance of hygiene to her children. <laughs> Although the water feeds the residents of Gambia, it's not exactly safe to drink. So like everyone else in the village, Sophia has to make a daily trip to the central water pump for clean, drinkable water. I 
After the construction of a water tank and pump by an NGO, residents of Gambia pay for the privilege of clean water as they ferry empty cans from their houses to the pumps and then full cans all the way back the same way, after queuing up of course. And now being summer holidays, the parents send out their young ones to do the boring and time-consuming chore. Sophia came to Islam Ahmadiyya a few years ago from one of the local Christian sects and has come to see a different world through Islam. Sophia is just one of the many young adults coming to Islam in Benin trend rising among many youth as they search for answers in life. Vodou, an ancient paganist religion, centered around worship of spirits and idols, with ritualistic chanting and dancing as forms of worship, is central to Benin, and one of its main religions. But it's seeing a slow decline as youngsters are leaving the Vodun faith behind, searching for faith elsewhere. Ibrahim is one of these people. He's just very recently found Islam Ahmadiyya as his calling. <laughs> Ibrahim. 
Donc j'ai commencé l'école au CI jusqu'en troisième. Donc les difficultés que j'ai vues donner est que il y a des moments qu'on ne me donne pas de l'argent pour aller à l'école. Je me débrouille pour aller. Donc il y a trop de charges. C'est pourquoi j'ai laissé les bancs et rentré dans ces activités. On m'a demandé à Vodou avant de me faire né. Donc je t'ai dans le Vodou, je fais tout. Dans ce Vodou là, je fais la prière, tout à Vodou. Pourquoi j'ai quitté dedans en Israël mais que le Vodou, on demande et il donne. Hey, Hussein, que jadou, Divana bana de Aisham me rukh apna mujhe Parvana bana de It's Friday and come noon there's going to be a large congregation for Friday prayers. With the busy day ahead, Mama does not have the time for fishing today. So she's going to head out into the market and hunt for a good bargain. I'm <laughs> Hunting for a bargain where every merchant is sharper than the next one is no task for the faint of heart. But Mama is a veteran in the art of the deal. She knows where something's a little fishy.
Lunch prep is not a woman's only job. It's a family event. Everyone gets stuck in. Eager anticipation of a hearty meal is always the best motivation. Professional fishermen of Gambier know not to cast their net in the same spot twice. So while the Akaja farms recoup their fish numbers, Fatah is heading out with Hassan for some good old-fashioned net fishing. Fishing in shallow waters with fragile nets is tricky business, so some skilled assistants go a long way in saving your net from a nasty tear. <laughs> Yeah. Ibrahim is on his way to show us one of the remote Vodun temples tucked away in the bush. sacrifice. <laughs> Yeah.
un seul enfant, un seul garçon. Et le moment est arrivé, le garçon, il est tombé dans l'eau. Et en le sortant, il est perdu. Il n'a plus l'esprit, il n'a plus de l'air pour faire ce truc-là. Tout le monde, les gens de Vodou qui font prière avec moi, donc les filles, les mamans, tout le monde joue là pour faire la prière. L'enfant n'est pas revenu. Donc tout le monde, nous, tout le monde disait que l'enfant est perdu. Nous allons le mettre, nous allons l'enterrer le corps. En tant je vais dans les, faire les, la cérémonie. Si un enterrement ne pas, je vais donner de l'argent. Je mange, je bois comment je veux, je danse, je fais n'importe quoi je veux. Lorsque l'enfant, le problème est arrivé à cet enfant, mon ami qui est dans l'Islam est arrivé et il a dit l'enfant ne peut pas partir, partir comme ça. Et il a commencé de faire la prière et il a demandé pour Et on lui a amené, il a ouvert en faisant la prière. Avec ça, l'enfant est revenu. C'est de là que j'ai dit à mon frère que je vais le suivre. Parce que j'étais dans le vaudou depuis, ça fait 25 ans dépassé. Le vaudou ne m'a pas fait certaines choses comme ça. Et il a fait sauver mon enfant. C'est de là que j'ai rentré en l'Islam en disant que je vais le suivre. C'est par quoi il a le pouvoir de faire guérir les... Auparavant, lorsque j'étais dans le vaudou, je fais tout, si j'ai de l'argent, j'appelle les gens, je dépense, je bois comme je veux. Mais maintenant, je ne bois plus, je ne bois plus. Je ne fais pas tout ces choses des heures avec les gens. Donc c'est de là que j'ai vu qu'il y a la différence entre l'Islam et le vaudou dans la vie. Most of us know all too well that life on land has its challenges, whether it's in the West or the heart of Africa. But the people of Gambier have made it their mission for the past few centuries to not let a little rain or water get in the way of what matters to them the most. La Madia m'a fait net, a fait net comme moi la, la vraie fois. Parce que déjà, pas ça de vie qui dit là où pour tous, là où pour personne. Bon, dans, dans mon entourage aujourd'hui, je ne fais que cultiver là où je n'ai plus le choix. Cette communauté m'a contraint à aimer tout le monde, comme mon frère. Je suis dans ma dans partout, je suis, on me considère comme un homme bien parce que les, mes attitudes, ce que ceux dont les missionnaires parlent, chaque fois je suis le bon attitude et je suis exemplaire devant euh, euh, ma société. Nous this remote, unique and truly wonderful village in the cradle of civilization has become a home to a few hundred Ahmadi Muslims and they have become a beacon, calling out to those around them, signaling the dawn of a new era for the water dwellers of Gambie and beyond. That what their hearts are searching for is not far away in some distant land where boats don't go and waters can't reach, but right here, among them, are people who have found their true calling the final key to undo any remaining shackles their hearts and minds might be bound by in the shape of their God, Allah, their guide, the Holy Quran, their master, the Holy Prophet, Muhammad, their shepherd, the promised Messiah, and their compass, the Khalifa of Islam. <laughs>
Welcome back. Before I introduce our last documentary for today, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind all of you that we will be joined by members of the cast and crew of our featured documentaries, which is Bullies and Basketball and the Undiscovered Continent, Argentina, after when we return. So please stay tuned after this next documentary and have your questions ready. Our final and feature documentary this evening for the theme of community outreach is The Undiscovered Continent, Argentina, written and directed by Mamoun Rashid. The Undiscovered Continent, Argentina is a striking documentary which follows Yusuf Seeger as he meets Imam Marwan Gill and learns about how the young Imam came to the country and started the Ahmadiyya Muslim communities first mission in the Spanish-speaking nation. So now let's watch the undiscovered continent, Argentina. जी अजीसा मैं एयरपोर्ट की तरफ निकल पड़ा हूँ जी हाँ जी हम एयरपोर्ट की तरफ जा रहे थे जाकला मार सब जी ओके अस्सलामुअलैकुम I just prayed my last prayer in Masjid Fazl behind Hazur it was quite emotional because I know it's um, it's gonna be for uh, till the next time. It's gonna be few months, could be few years. It's definitely it's a privilege. I feel really privileged that uh, Zoo chose me for this mission. And even when I asked Zoo to give me some guidelines about the mission, about the mission house, and Zoo's reply was like, "Who is going to Argentina? Is it you or is it me?" When I got really shocked and it was like a heavy earthquake was when I went to Majid Sab Wakilut Tafsir Sab. And I asked him to give me any um, letters, documents, mm. reports regarding Argentina or who can I contact, who is the missionary mission house. And then he replied to me, uh, there is no one, you are the first missionary. I've always been fascinated with Argentina, its culture, its cuisine, its people, its natural wonders from the Iguaza waterfalls in the north, the Patagonia's snow-covered peaks in the south are truly breathtaking. Being a convert, I was interested in knowing the experiences of other converts as compared to my own. It was important for me to see the Jamaat as a worldwide community, united under one Khalifa. I was curious to find out more about Islam in current day South America. I wanted to start my journey around the South American continent in a country where Tbilig was still in its infancy, at a grassroots level in order to understand what it took to establish a new Jamaat in a foreign land. A place where I could see the fulfillment of Hazrat Muslim Aul, may Allah be pleased with them, Tariq Hajadid scheme, with my own eyes. In the not too distant past, the country was under years of military dictatorship, when it had warfare and bloodshed, but it's also produced Che Guevara, Mardona, Messi, and the first Pope from the New World. Pope Francis. I started to wonder how the true message of Islam would be received there. And I had no idea what to expect. This was an experience I was highly anticipating. No matter how familiar the place felt, 
I was in a foreign land. Suitcase in hand, with an adventure on the horizon, I took in the sights and sounds. Everything was new and exciting. I walked with wondering eyes, admiring my new surroundings and observing its people. I was here at last. As I looked forward to touring my way through Buenos Aires, the Paris of South America, I couldn't help but reflect on the excitement and the magic that came with exploring a new city. I was ready to go. Try some asado and meet the people of Argentina and the land of the sun of May. I was excited to meet Murphy Sub, Marwan Gill, the first ever missionary sent to Argentina. I wanted to know all about his experiences in Argentina. When Murphy Sub first arrived here, he couldn't speak a word of Spanish. Sharing a truly inspiring story, Murphy Sub explained how, just before leaving for Argentina, he had the honor of meeting Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi the fifth. May Allah be his helper. So the first challenge was to communicate with people. It was a hard and tough time in the beginning. Often he felt isolated and disconnected with society due to the language barrier. Another challenge was to get socially integrated here. It means making friends and social contacts. What, was, what were those struggles? So you get here, you don't know any language, you're all by yourself. Tell me about learning how to swim in that water. So the best examples of this, how I learned or with the prayers and with the blessed words of Fazul, how I learned swimming, for example, is I arrived here, there was no one to receive me, I went straight up to the hotel. Okay, for the first two months, I stayed in the hotel looking for apartments. And in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, it's really hard to settle down as a foreigner, especially if you don't know the language. There are like legal requirements, you have to fulfill them to rent an apartment. I, I wasn't fulfilling these requirements. So when I even went to meet the landlady, and I told her I presented myself, and one big issue was missing. It was like you need a property, a guarantee of property in Buenos Aires. I didn't have it. But when I introduced myself, miraculously, she said, OK, it's fine. Alhamdulillah, with the blessings of Allah and special prayers and guidance of Hazur, may Allah be his helper, the process of settling down was much easier than expected. He enrolled in university to immerse himself in Spanish joined a local football club. He was able to make friends and socialize. Durante el entrenamiento que tenemos con los chicos los lunes y miércoles acá en la plaza, que es todo acondicionamiento físico, un día estaba pasando por acá, me preguntaste qué era lo que hacíamos. Obviamente vos hablabas inglés, yo no tanto. Eh, nos pudimos eh, pasar los números telefónicos y desde ahí te sumaste a entrenar con nosotros eh, a la condición física y actualmente sos parte del equipo de fútbol. When I met uh, Marvan, I, I found that uh, there were a lot of similarities between a Christian, uh, Christians and, 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 and the Christian religion and the, and the Muslim religion. No? For example, uh, preaching a God that, that is love or preaching love uh, and not hate, for example, was something that I found very interesting that was common for, 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 for both of us. Having realized the great interest of people in Islam, Murphy Saab started having regular Islam and Arabic classes in public coffee shops. He also used the Arabic language in an attempt to attract people towards the true teachings of Islam. During one such open house, I attended a class, wanting to get to know some of the individuals attending and particularly their thoughts and views on Islam. You te presentas, yo soy musulman, I'm a Muslim, sí, y la otra persona Shia o Sunni. Mm. Entonces, esa diferencia tan marcada que se vive en el mundo, mm. en todo el mundo, es, es la que hace que, que la gente se aleje de Dios. Entonces, eh, en la comunidad Ahmadiyya no notas esa diferencia. Los brazos siempre están abiertos para todo aquel que quiera saber el verdadero mensaje del Islam. Mm. Un verdadero mensaje el cual no te lleva a la violencia, el cual no te hace este, que otra persona por ser de una escuela diferente o una religión diferente tengas que apartarlo. Eh, eh, es el verdadero Islam, el, el, el Islam que Rasulullah enseñó, que todos estuviéramos unidos en el mundo y que fuera una religión de paz y fuera universal. La diferencia 
básicamente radica en eso. No el, el, el Islam, eh, la organización Ahmadi promueve la paz, el amor y el entendimiento entre todos los hermanos. It was an eye-opening experience to visit the ABC Mundial radio station and speak with journalists who had recently met with Hazrat Khalifa Tolmasi V, may Allah be his helper, at the Justice Salon in UK. I was interested in their thoughts and experiences. Y muchas gracias, uh, Nerio, y él también nos ayudó muchísima en establecer la comunidad en uh, Argentina. ¿no? O él era como el primer puente uh, para uh, establecer la comunidad Ahmadiyya en Argentina. ¿Y cuánto ha hecho? Eh? Sí, um, Hasta su arribo, obviamente. Es, a ver, comentemos a los amigos. De pronto, cuando llega el imán Marwan aquí en la Argentina, eran poquitas, poquitas las palabras que sabía de nuestra lengua en español. De pronto hoy hasta se permite algunos chascarrillos. Sí, ¿eh? es, es, es verdad Alejandro, ¿te acordás? No? Al principio teníamos más problemas en comunicarnos, ¿no? So, Donald, I love, I love his voice. I had no idea that this voice was hidden inside. I got a glimpse of it in the cab, because I started getting a good feeling when he would talk. But when he came on the mic, it was like something jumped out of him. And so I just, I had this feeling, I just have to hear him say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Bien, okay. Alhamdu. Alhamdu. Lillahi. Lillahi. Rabbil. Rabbil. Alameen. Alameen. MashaAllah. See? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Al, ah, Una experiencia desde lo propio, muy particular, muy fuerte, este, recuerdo eh, sus palabras, ¿no? El, eh, incluso hasta la bendición final que nos ha eh, dado en aquella oportunidad, es como un bálsamo de energía. Se sintió, lo percibimos, algo distinto de, este, de descubrirlo a través de la comunidad Amadí. ¿eh? Uh -huh. eh, ese eslogan, ¿sí? Eh, a ver, lo repetimos juntos, el eslogan. Amor para todos, odio para nadie. De pronto uno dice, pero esto queda solamente en palabras. Y con el tiempo eh, observamos que eso se trasladaba a los hechos, de que era una, una cuestión cotidiana para ustedes. ¿Mm? El odio para nadie, amor para, para todos, o amor para todos, odio para nadie. Eh, para mí eh, tuve una experiencia eh, personal eh, increíble. Primero por, por mi, mi encuentro con Dios en ese momento cuando eh, ustedes estaban orando, yo eh, recé y eh, tuve un encuentro muy, eh, muy personal con Dios y pude llegar a sentir que Él me estaba escuchando. Y, y esa experiencia eh, te la transmití porque fue muy emocionante y a su vez eh, la pude eh, expresar en una carta que después de regresar aquí a la Argentina le escribí a su santidad por medio tuyo y le, le expresé todo lo que sentí en ese momento y, y él me respondió a los 15 20 días recibió mi carta por medio tuyo y a los 15 20 días eh, recibí su respuesta, eh, que él se alegraba, eh, mi experiencia y eh, se alegraba que yo había eh, podido llegar y, había, y se alegraba del, eh, del encuentro que yo había tenido con Dios y a su vez que él este, eh, en sus rezos, en sus oraciones va a tener presente este, a esta periodista de acá de Argentina. Murbisab organized a day trip to Villa Carlos Paz in Cordoba province, about 740 kilometers northwest from Buenos Aires. Carlos Paz is famous for the peacefulness of the river and nature of the mountains, situated just west of Cordoba in central Argentina. It was to be an overnight bus trip, which gave us some time to reflect. Upon our arrival in the morning, we were greeted by brother Gonzalo Huertes, a recent convert to Islam Ahmadiyya. His smile immediately made me feel at home. 
and I couldn't wait to experience the famous hospitality of an Argentinian family. I played uh, to, to be cowboy. To be cowboy, yeah. 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 When I tell uh, it's because you are. I, feel, I, I felt uh, clean this wood. Clean this wood? <laughs> Asado, or an array of barbecue meats, are a mainstay of every Argentina plate. The parrilla is the grandmaster of all grilling devices an extraordinary tool that captures the primal essence of cooking meat, which is salt and fire. Larger cuts are put on the grill first, as these big chunks can take hours to cook on low heat. Thinner and smaller steaks come later. Andrew, both. The meat is rarely marinated, just sprinkled with coarse grilling salt, either right before or once it hits the grill. Enjoy it. I'm having fun, but like I, I want to hear like how he came to be a Muslim, right? And I'm just, I just, his community still embraces him. Look, he has friends everywhere. His family is not Muslim, right? But like he seems like uh, like very devout Muslim, and I just like, I don't know. I want to, I want to learn more. I got to hear the story of like how and like uh, what it's like to like continue to be Muslim here. So you said you've been Muslim two years, right? And Ahmadi seven months. Can you explain how you found Islam and how you got to Ahmadiyya? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, two years ago, I, I convert to Islam. Uh, I was uh, Christian before, mm. uh, and uh, I I I I not find find the the, the a dancer, mm. no. No, no, no way, no way, no satisfaction. Mm. And I begin to find out uh, information about Islam. I read, in, I, I read, uh, I, I looking for internet, uh, and I arrive to a mosque in Cordoba. Mm. Uh, there, receive me. Uh, Muslim and explain uh, about the Islam, and I I like it. I like yeah. it. I, I said it's very interesting. Uh, so I, I went uh, three or four times, um, and I I take the decision to tell Muslim. Mm. Okay. Only four times. Only four times, yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, it was uh, news, uh, new, new for me. No, I, I don't knew people uh, in Islam. I yeah. don't knew Muslim. Yes. Yeah. How is uh, how is the relation? Yes. No. And and then uh, about four, uh, eight or nine uh, months ago. I knew to Marban here mm. in the internet. Uh, he contacted me. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and asked me, uh, do you speak uh, English? <laughs> first question. <laughs> first good question. First question they asked me, do you speak English? And I said, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. No. But uh, really, I, I am studying. Uh, Four or five months ago, no. Before I don't don't speak, 
Okay. And uh, Marwan uh, made the, the, the effort for communicate with me in Spanish. Okay. Uh, like that, begin a relationship with Marwan, and he explained me about uh, Islam and about uh, promises Messiah. Uh, and, and about the community, uh, I, I liked me. So, see Marbisab like speak um, uh, Spanish, right? With these guys in ten months, it's been amazing. I mean, I think like it just goes to show like how did Hazur know like the guy that doesn't have any background in Spanish, zero Spanish, sends him to this country. How did he know that in ten months this guy was going to be explaining religious concepts? in Spanish, and not only that, now teaching Arabic, grammatical concepts in Arabic, in Spanish, and he's got people from three different Spanish-speaking countries, and they understand these concepts. Like, because I, th there's still basic concepts, but like, I could tell, like, their understanding, not only were they getting it, they were getting it very quickly. So that meant that, like, uh, his communication was incredibly clear. And so it was just, it was, I just, I was flabbergasted, you know, like, uh, I'm sitting there like recording, putting it in Twitter, you know what I mean? And then like, uh, I don't know when people got it, but like that was, it was insane to see you like in 10 months, anybody could do anything like that. Each time I experience a new travel destination, I leave a little more enlightened, educated and enriched. This was certainly true of Carlos Paz and his welcoming residents. I learned something new as I listened more to my hosts. When I embraced that mindset, I became more open and willing to learn about the Argentine culture. Carlos Paz was an amazing, vibrant experience, one I wasn't going to forget in a hurry. My stay in Argentina was coming to an end. We took in the sights around the city. This city is beautiful. Strolling through the streets, I couldn't help but pay attention to the magnificent architecture all around me. The outdoor markets in almost every neighborhood, colorful and unique. We passed El Ateneo Grand Splendid. I had to stop and take a look. This must be the most opulent bookstore in South America. A book lover's palace located in an old theater, retaining all the decadence of an Italian opera house. Venturing through the city center, you could see the chaotic mix of old fashioned cafes, grand 19th century public edifices, high-rise office buildings and tearing traffic. The city center exudes energy and elegance. The Abelisco de Buenos Aires is a national historic monument erected in 1936 to commemorate the first foundation of the city. While I was there, the Abelisco hosted the opening ceremony of the 2018 Summer Youth Olympics. Apparently, the avenue is the widest in the world, although I didn't make any measurements to verify. Floralis Generica, a stunning 20 meter high stainless steel flower sculpture which towers over the Plaza de las Nacianos Unidas. It's a mechanical flower that opens and closes its petals with the sun symbolizing the hope of being reborn every day. It's so easy to make friendship or social contact with Argentinians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so easy to get into conversation with them. Yes. That's something typical Argentinians. So that's why many of my contacts and friendships I made them. For example, my football friends, mm. uh, they were playing in the park and I just, I just went for a jog and running mm. and I just saw them, you know, and I just went to them. I said like, yeah, I'm from Germany. Mm. I'm new here and I don't know many people. So can I join you guys? And yeah. they said, yeah, come over. Yeah, and that's how we made the friendship, and now I'm playing regularly for them and with the football team. I can I can I cannot wait to see you go play football and see the Argentinians play football. You know, it's it's also yeah, exactly football. Football is was missing. <laughs> you know, Maradona, Messi, mm. and football is for them like 
the culture, like football is their life. Football in Argentina, they say, is a religion, almost a cult. It is a game that touches life perhaps more here than anywhere else in the world. The blue and yellow of Boca Juniors can be seen everywhere. To experience their fans in stadium on game day is a truly remarkable experience. La Bombonera's towering stands amplify the crowd noise and it gets really loud. Heading down to the restored docks on a beautiful spring night with Murphy Sub. We ended up talking about the State of the Union, crossing the docks to Buenos Aires, elite district of Puerto Madero. You undoubtedly see one of the city's most iconic structures, El Puente de la Mahur, or the Woman's Bridge. A beacon to all pedestrians, this elegant and sophisticated homage to woman is one of the city's most contemporary structures curving over the waters of the Rio de la Plata. What we are doing now, what we are aiming to do is um, to just present Islam to them as an easy religion to practice. And many times people or the next generation is turning away from religion in general because there are so many, uh, always just rules and regulations but without explaining the wisdom. Mm. So when we come, we try to explain and give them also, try to give them the possibility to ask all their doubts. It's not just you have to believe, you have to believe because it's like this. So to just give them the possibility and to explain to them everything logically, you know, and then also like most importantly, it's like to uh, teach them the faith by your example. The why. Exactly. I was greatly anticipating my visit to the first mission house of the Jamaat in Argentina. Having recently been established in the Palermo neighborhood of Buenos Aires, it manifested another fulfillment of the revelation, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. However, it had been a challenge for Merbisop to find an appropriate place for a mission house. With the mission house, we needed also, again, a guarantee, you know, a yeah. property uh, in Buenos Aires to provide or to uh, assure them that we'll be able to pay the rent. And in the mission house, it happened the same. I just presented myself as Islamic theology, mm -hmm. representative of the mm -hmm. Ahmadiyya community, my work, my, our humanitarian work, our aim here in Argentina, and also the landlady for the mission house, she said, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I will rent you the place without even this guarantee. Yes. So I think it's like all, it's not coincidence. At each step or each challenge I had to take, I didn't know the language, I didn't have any friends here, no social contacts, mm -hmm. you know? And everything, alhamdulillah, with the time I got, I found the, somehow I managed to find like social contacts, social friends. I joined a football club, they accepted me. I started meeting um, people from different, or representatives from different religions, you know, and um, we had like a successful, we participated in the first book fair. Afterwards, we had the mission house. So everything, alhamdulillah, is, I think it's all the result of the blessed words and prayers of mm -hmm. Khalifa al -Masih. I think whatever we have achieved, if we have achieved something or whatever has done has been done in one year, it was just the blessings and the prayers of Fazur. You know, just before coming, I was so nervous. You know, mm. I was like, where to start, what to do, how is it going to happen, you know, mm. without knowing the language, uh, without having anyone to guide you, to help you. Because I, when I graduated, I was 27. You know, for me, I was still a child. You know, usually mm. you spend so much time with others to learn from them. They guide you, they help you. So I was like, I'm 27 and now the Jamaat or Hazur is trusting me to lead a whole country, mm. you know, and lead a country which is the eighth largest country of the whole world. Was como tenías miedo cuando te dijiste cuando te dije que vamos a también como abrir un lugar. Sí, no, no miedo, no, me dio confianza. Ajá, por ejemplo, como un lugar para Islam o para la religión. Sí, 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 sí. Tenías como miedo o te sentiste como cómoda. Yo pensé que, que no, que, que ojalá que os vaya muy bien. Ajá. <risa> y, y ahora, uh, para, para vos, ¿cómo te está, parece Está tu linda, casa? está linda, Ajá. está diferente, no es la misma. Sí, claro. Santiago, thank you for coming here. Thank you for taking the time to, to meet with me. So, I heard that you just accepted Ahmadiyya one week ago and that you were so excited 
that you couldn't wait any longer and that you had to do bath right away. Um, could you please tell me about um, uh, how you felt Ahmadiyyad and like your excitement to sign bath? Este, bueno, eh, fue digamos ahí cuando yo empecé a hacerme preguntas por el, el lado espiritual de, del ser humano, ¿no? Este, por la parte espiritual. Este, y, y bueno, este, esto, bueno, habrán pasado, yo ahora tengo 33 años, este, y bueno, lo conocí a Marwan en, en una feria del libro que se hace acá en Argentina una vez por año, y él me regaló un folleto de la comunidad musulmana Amadía. Este, yo antes de esto ya estaba empezando a estudiar acerca del Islam este, y la verdad me parecía muy interesante este, la filosofía islámica, este, el concepto que tienen de Dios los musulmanes. I've, I've heard um, that you have your own rendition of Sir Fatia and I would, I would love to hear it if, uh, if that's okay. Okay. Audhu billahi min shaytanir rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Arrahmanir rahim Maliki yawmiddin Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in Ihdina sirat al mustaqim sirat al ladina namta alayhim gar al maqdubi alayhim walak dalim Amen. 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 I found that the good things, as a convert, the good things in my culture, right, are, are Islamic, right, and we just never knew it. And I feel like it's the same thing with Argentina. When I see it, like, the fact that people want to come out and be together outside, this is an Islamic concept, you know, the fact that we have to come out and pray together, God could have easily prescribed that we just pray five daily prayers at home, right? It's still a lot of prayers. But the, uh, the encouragement is that we come out and we do it together. And Argentinians are already like the focus I've noticed so much is to come out and be together as family and as a country yeah. and, a, and, as, and as a people. So they, they're practicing Islam already and they don't know it. They just need to add some sajdas. Exactly. And because now I feel, especially in Argentina, we need to present them the true Islam. People are looking around for mm. Islam. They're looking for someone to give them orientation in life because they have turned away from Christianity. They realize Christianity is not giving them this kind of happiness, you know, many Argentinians. So they're looking for alter alternatives. So we need them, we need to give them and be here present to show them our alternative, you know, to find happiness. Because Argentinians, they're really lovely people, you know, and um, the reason is that from the beginning, it was a country, so that's why I think also the Argentinian culture is for them easier to adopt, to accept Islam in their society because they've always been open-minded yeah. for foreigners, for other cultures, for other uh, values, you know. Uh, and so far I have also experienced like, I had a really positive feedback here yeah. in Buenos Aires so far. So mostly people, they receive you with open arms, you know. They have prejudice about Islam, but they have also this interest to find out more about you. Yeah. We just got to say, Mata, Barbecue and Islam will be the, ne the next one. <laughs> this should be the next, uh, <laughs> exactly. Within one year after being sent to Argentina, by the sheer grace of Allah, we had inaugurated our mission house and the Jamaat was established in Argentina. Now, beside the daily use for prayers every Sunday, the mission house has an open day. Its doors are open for everyone to find out more about the true teachings of Islam and the advent of the promised Messiah, on whom be peace. I've read that a spiritual experience is a soul-moving experience. But what surprised me about my experience in this country was that it unexpectedly brought so much change in me. Buenos Aires is not one of those cities in which, in order to survive, you have to forget you're human. Many will go out of the way to help out, be it helping you find your way somewhere or giving you a suggestion for places to go and people to meet. The little thing. The humanity here is what made Buenos Aires a true joy to visit. As I leave, I wholeheartedly believe that in order to build from one set of beliefs, 
to a new set of beliefs. We need to create the necessary conceptual bridges that encompass our shared values. The work being done in Argentina has both the theoretical and the methodological foundation to succeed both now and in the future, inshallah. Along with the most important ingredient, the continued prayers of Hazrat Khalifa Tomasi V, may Allah be his helper. I think it looked better, like maybe on your jacket too. You know, like that. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So once I have the new style, is it okay? Mm -hmm. Or should I take it off? Yeah, you gotta give River a steak. River will not, he's not a bulk guy. So, uh, answer what do you want? That doesn't mean I'm paying, right? Hmm? <laughs> that mean case pay. Pocho, croissant. He becomes a bulk when he's paying, oh, but when he eats, he's a river. He's, he's a savage, <laughs> just like a hamburger. <laughs> I know they can hear me. But you see when they say we're ready, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have the yeah, we'll have this conversation. Yeah, exactly. And, and then after after two seconds they're gonna be like, oh wait, 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 no, I, I have no, no boca, no river. No, no, uh, you, you're a river. <laughs> no, no, you're a river. <laughs> Thank you, Mamsa. No, I think my Munsab is still not happy. Assalamualaikum. So we are back with some of our panel members. We're waiting for some of the other ones to join. Um, before we start, just a reminder that in order to have your questions asked, please make sure to write question in front of your oh. query in all caps. So with me, Right now, I have Yusuf Seeger Sahib, Asif Hadi Sahib, Usman Jamil Sahib, and Noman Mia Sahib. And hopefully, we're expecting Iman, Imam Marwan Gil Sahib and Ansar Javed Sahib. So, can you gentlemen please tell me what were your roles on the documentaries? And for Yusuf Seeger Sahib, that would be both documentaries. I said, by you start. You start. Where would you like me to start from? What was your role on the documentary? And and then we can go to Yusuf and the, the other. Of course. So, uh, Slam to everyone. Um, so, basically, my role for the documentary was mainly to film and direct the documentary. But the idea itself actually came from Brother Yusuf. Um, um, the way it started was that I was in Canada. We just finished up an assignment of building the studios, which is currently uh, running in Canada at the moment. And on the way back, I was asked to swing by Belize and go and see this basketball league. Um, I don't play basketball myself, so I don't know much about basketball. Uh, but this was a request made by Yusuf, Brother Yusuf, through to my director in London. And he had asked me to come and just see the, what's going on there. And once we landed, 
that's when it all unraveled. So I guess for me, um, you know, Asabai was kind enough to give me uh, producer credits on uh, the Belize and, and basketball documentary. And uh, I guess initially I really, I, I was never planning on being in the documentary. I think it just kind of, it kind of worked out that way. When we initially started out, like, uh, I don't think we were 100% sure, like, what we wanted to film and, like, what, how we wanted to tell the story. And so it just kind of, it kind of ended up being that way. But um, after, after some convincing. And uh, with the uh, with the Argentina documentary, um, you know, I, honestly, I felt I felt like I just wanted, you know, you know, my Mumbai, he had he had told me like this was his like vision and his dream, and I I really just kind of wanted to help him like bring it to fruition because I think he had an excellent idea. Mashallah. Uh With me and my role, I think Yusuf touched on it in the documentary. Um, he was just connecting dots. He saw a big need for someone that could serve basketball and orchestrate a, a basketball camp and I think he touched on it that's uh, I've been fortunate enough to be blessed opportunities to work a lot of camps and then organize and run camps on my own so it was a no-brainer for me to jump on board and get a chance to serve and and be a director per se or, or one of many directors to be honest with you because I learned a lot even from the locals there the local coaches and getting a chance to merge with them and mix ideas and just to serve with them so I guess you could say that was my, my role, spread love and organize camps. Jazakallah. Uh, Noman Sahib? Uh, Assalamu uh, So my role in the documentary, in the, the Argentina documentary, was uh, director of photography. Uh, myself and uh, Ansar Javed, we were part of the filming crew. And uh, Mamoun Bay was uh, the director, and uh, he wrote the entire script. and. Uh, Brother Yusuf Saab was one of our hosts, and uh, Marwan Saab was our uh, murabi that was in Argentina. And Marwan Saab, as we know that you were part of the documentary, um, how did you feel, what was your experience like being part of it and being the central focus of it as well? Uh, as to everyone. Um, yeah, I think it was a huge pressure for me. Uh, on one side, I felt so honored just by the fact having like some Andy brothers around you, because usually, as you could see in the documentary, it's mostly like um, a very small Jamaat, few members. So just by having these guys in for one week around, uh, it gave me also a lot of energy and strength also, and it was nice having the boys around. But also I felt a, a huge pressure <laughs> because it was a sm small time period and to fit everything in, and uh, trying to present also everything so in this sense it was a mixture of nervousness but also like um, uh, the boys i think they brought a, a new energy with them and also which we could i personally could feel but also our members Jazakallah. so unfortunately director mamun rashid saab isn't available for this discussion so one of our questions to all of you is what was it like staying in the countries that you filmed in and working with the people who live there? So if I could ask Asif Hadisab to start. Sorry, if you could just repeat that question, I was completely signed out for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was it like staying in the countries where you filmed, so Belize, and how was it working with the people who live there? Of course. Um, so Belize itself was my first visit to any Central American country. Um, so for me, it was a completely new experience. Um, when I was initially given the assignment, I actually Googled where Belize was. Um, coming from Europe, I had no idea um, what it would be like initially. Um, obviously, when you go online, you always find the negative stuff first. Um, so we were told, you know, it's one of the countries with the highest crime rate and, you know, murder rates and homicide rates really high. Um, but when I arrived there, the experience we had, to be honest, I know in the documentary we did mention some of the negative stuff, but overall, it was an amazing experience on the ground when you meet people, um, the people who are working behind the ABL League, um, some of the people in the towns, some of the people in the villages. Uh, because we got to travel all around the country. So the experience is completely different to what I was told initially. And I think the people are lovely, to be honest. Um, and I think I, I would recommend everyone to visit there. The country itself is amazing. It's a beautiful country. Um, so yeah, we had a pleasant experience. Uh, 
Yusuf Saib and Usman Saib. Do you want to go first, Usman Saib? Um, sure. I think one thing that really jumped out to me on the experience was, um, I remember reflecting on this with Yusuf too and a couple of the guys is, you pretty much get two weeks to detox yourself from everything that you're so used to. A lot of the, the social triggers and the imagery triggers that you're so used to growing up in the West, in America or Canada, for instance, like McDonald's logos or Starbucks logos, so much that you don't realize until you put yourself in a third world country uh, around people. Uh, so that was one thing that really jumped out was you get two weeks of detox from that stuff. And then you come to appreciate um, where these people and what they're living and some of the, the struggles that they're going through. And I think our spiritual guide, uh, Hazur Anwar, is always telling us to, to when, you, when you compare your lives, you should be looking to people that are below you to put life in perspective. And I think it was a, a great opportunity. And I think just like um, others have reiterated, that's one of the big opportunities I think we're blessed with is when we get a chance to serve, we can not only serve in our countries, but we can serve in other countries, um, places that aren't as well off. You know, I, I mean, for me, I, I, I love traveling and meeting other people from other cultures. Um, it, 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 not only do I get to learn like how other people view and see the world um, and like the relationship, I guess, with like, you know, their country and like each other. But also I learn a lot about myself as well. Right. Because a lot of things seem like kind of like very innate, but they're not right They're You know, I'm definitely Americanized, Canadianized now. And, um, you know, I get, I get to kind of see that a little bit whenever I, I travel there as well. And I feel like as Ahmadis, we always have like a, an advantage whenever we travel, because as soon as we get to any country in the world, we know somebody. Right. And like that advantage to kind of know the locals and like know the people that are living there and immediately be able to go to, you know, the best the places you have to see, the, you know, the people you have to meet, you know, the food you have to get, you know, like, and, you know, it's uh, we're kind of at an advantage. So I always look forward to it. And it's, and it's been blessed. And it's definitely it's, it's affecting my worldview for sure. Jazakallah. Uh, additionally, uh, Yusuf Saib, you were on both the Belize documentary and the Argentina documentary. So was there a striking difference in the culture that you experienced? What was it like having gone on both? You know, I, I mean, there was different things about uh, each culture, you know, like um, I, 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 you know, I loved about Belize was like, it, it really is like a basketball culture, you know, just like Muslims come at sunset for like, uh, for Maghrib, you know, like Belizeans come out to the basketball courts to play basketball. And you can like drive around Belize and like kind of pick the court that you want to play at that night and see who's playing. And, you know, Argentina, I, I'll tell you something that was so fascinating about Argentina to me is that they like to work out and be out side together all the time so like really like you if you go to the park you'll see like people in groups exercising together because that's like their gym routine and like there's such a focus on like being together it, it was it was really beautiful and i think that like you know like maybe american i know in canada because it's so cold we kind of get more ostracized and tend to stay in our houses but argentina is not that there are there are people that love to be around each other and love each other and like i really felt it you know it wasn't it wasn't just family it was community in argentina as well Jazakallah. Uh, Noman Saib and Marwan Saib. Uh, I'll start with Marwan Saib first, since you were a Jamia student who was German studying in the UK and then went to Argentina and had to learn Spanish. So what was it like? What was the culture shock like? I think, um, yeah, as, as mentioned, uh, there was different, uh, in this sense, I was raised uh, all life in Europe, in Germany, then UK. So the biggest shock was with the criminality rate and all these kind of acts with violence. So in the beginning, I felt like really shocked. I arrived here and I was used of using mobile phone like in Europe, you know, that you don't have the fear that someone's going to just come and grab your phone. And even if you're in a bus, in taxi, even or on the just on the streets walking around. And I remember that many friends of mine in the beginning, the initial friends, they used to be like, Maran, be careful. You're a stranger and people, they know they're going to see you, that you're a foreigner and you're going to be a special attraction for them, you know. And I took it very light, but uh, after admitting, it was just one month when I saw myself, how people got robbed on the streets, their phones or other stuff. So it was a big um, shock for me in this sense um, to always being careful on the streets, being also skeptic towards uh, other people you don't know. So... 
in this sense, I felt a change in myself. So even when I got back now for holidays in Europe, so I, I remember, I realized that I had a different mindset. I took the mindset now from Argentina also over there sometimes, you know, so you would be more careful with your belongings or your phones on streets. So this was one of the negative sides, I think, um, which I experienced myself. Uh, Alhamdulillah, by God's grace, nothing happened to me personally. Um, but on the other side, I think, as Yusuf said, I would totally agree, which I also perceived here was the social nearness and also social openness. Um, so, for example, also in, in regards of Islam or also personally. So I remember, for example, being a German, um, we Germans are very distant and very close. So even if you have questions or uh, hesitations about certain things, you're not going to ask the person directly. You rather you prefer to keep with these uh, prejudice or thoughts in your heart. But here with Argentina, I've seen they're very open minded and very direct. So even, for example, let's say you're in a shop waiting and uh, the cashier, they're going to ask you, ah, where are you from? Are you an Arab? <laughs> are you from Asia? Where are you from? What are you doing here? Uh, and uh, also, like, obviously, even with my wife, obviously, she wears the Islamic veil. So even on the streets, many people come up and ask her, why are you wearing the veil or where are you from? Are you Muslims? So I think this is the positive or very um, beautiful aspect of the Argentinian culture. So it's very easy to make the social context, social friendships, and to build these kind of bridges with the people. Jazakallah. And Noman Saib, what about your experience? Uh, my experience was, uh, you know, a lot like uh, Brother Yusuf and, and also what um, Marwan Saab said. Uh, it was my first time going to any South Af uh, South American country and Argentina obviously was my first time. And, you know, when I went there, you know, speaking about the culture, I felt like, you know, everyone was very open, very accepting. You know, I personally didn't feel any sort of, uh, you know, security concerns that we would have had. Uh, we were carrying some very expensive, you know, camera gear and going all over the city. And uh, we just felt that, you know, we were part of part of their culture and and uh, Argentinians, they, they love their coffee. So, you know, that was something that really resonated with me. Um, you know, we enjoyed a lot of coffee there and uh, they're very open to dialogue. And uh, it was just overall a very good experience for me. Jazakallah. So as the cast and crew, what did you all do to prepare for your documentaries? And why did you agree to working on these projects? Asif Saab, would you like to start? Um, <clears throat> I didn't have a choice, to be honest. But uh, no, I was sent. It was an instruction I received. Um, couldn't make too much preparation because it was very last minute. Um, uh, when we arrived there, um, to be honest, before you do any documentaries, it's usually recommended that you wreck the location. You get some information beforehand so you know exactly what kit to take with you. Um, which, you know, how many individuals, like, if you need a crew, uh, we didn't get a chance to do that. So when we arrived, we basically had a single camera, small GH5, um, one lens, actually two lens, I think, at the time. Um, so we couldn't prepare much for it. But to be honest, when we arrived, the, the actual Jamaat there, um, Imam Navid Mangla, who's the organizer behind ABL there, um, he was very helpful, as in he completely, he you know, gave us all the guidance, Within a couple of days, I briefed us exactly what the plan is. Um, I remember sitting with um, Brother Yusuf and Naveed Pai saying, okay, so what's the plan? Um, what are we actually doing, you know? Um, so we sat down, we planned from there, and we just did Bismillah and just went went straight ahead. Jazakallah. Naman Saib, what about your experience? Uh, so our experience, you know, um, you know, with with documentary filmmaking, your experience starts well before you get on on location and you start filming. Uh, you know, you have to make sure that you know the scripts are ready, and that's a lot of that. Uh, Mumbai was taken care of, but from our perspective, uh, we were responsible to make sure that all of the gear that is required, um, you know, it's accounted for. We make sure we have everything, um, because especially when you're going to a foreign country you don't want to you know miss any sort of pieces of gear that are going to you know sort of uh you know create some complications in terms of you know going uh going towards your production so um and then once we got to argentina our schedule was pretty grueling um you know uh, marvan sav knows and yusuf sav will also know that uh, every day we had full days you know we were traveling constantly shooting and uh, so you have to kind of keep make sure that your energy levels are 
are all there. And that was pretty easy. We had we had a very fun group that we were on. So it was it was always fun to to, to continue shooting in, in the long days. And um, and then afterwards, you know, the process once we leave Argentina, it's, it still continues where a lot of the post production work starts to uh, begin and and the editing process to start. So it's a it's a full process that starts well before we get on site to Argentina and it continues uh, once we once we leave the country. Jazakallah. So now the cast, Yusuf Saib, what did you all do? Uh, Yusuf Saib and Osman Saib and Marwan Saib, what did you all do to prepare and why did you agree to this docu to your respective documentaries? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, honestly, there was nothing I did to prepare. Uh, we ran these camps the year before and my mentality was, and the first priority was make sure we serve every location we're going to the basketball camps and more in charge of the organizational side. And credit to Asif Hadi and the whole documentary crew, because obviously they had to squeeze in a lot of interviews on court at locations, but I didn't feel like they were ever in the way. Um, and there was times where they'd, they'd interview right on the court. Um, but, it, but I think from an organizational standpoint, we were still able to serve just as effectively, if not better, um, than the years prior where we didn't do any documentaries while doing camps. Uh, I don't know if Yusuf can touch more on that. I mean, I, I feel like Usman is being uh, being really humble. There's a lot of work that goes into planning out those camps and all the material. And I mean, everything from getting because, you know, a big part of this is we distributed a lot of T-shirts and stuff and gear while we were there. And, you know, Usman Bai was instrumental in like bringing uh, equipment from a not for profit that he found. I, I think it was I don't, I don't remember. It wasn't Mar it was possibly in Maryland. Was it in Maryland? Um, yeah. Leveling the playing field. <laughs> Just for fun. Leveling the, play, leveling the playing field, right? And so, you know, there was a lot of, it, it was so multifaceted because, you know, and, you know, thank God Usman Bai is such a professional. He's been doing this for years. And so, like, you know, there was a part of me that wanted to kind of be like, all right, which drills are we going to do? And you could tell, like, Usman Bai was like, I got this under control. And so him and Kaleem Bai and all those guys did such an amazing job of, of like, or, you know, keeping the camps together. And, you know, I, and, you know and, and Belize Jamaat was amazing. They had everything lined up for us uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of us getting there. We just kind of had to, we had to kind of arrive and, they put us in, into the location and we were able to kind of just, you know, and then Usman Bai took over with the camps. And so, you know, Belize Jamaat did such an amazing job of planning everything. I mean, that was, you know, from the north of the country to the south and like they, they planned for everything, you know, transportation, food and drink. It was, it was an incredible amount of work, you know, and as of Hadith Sahib, I mean, like those poor MTA guys, because there was, you have to see that there's multiple teams and multiple cars doing multiple things, right? And so they're trying to capture it all at the same time, but they're only like one car. And so, you know, the difficulty of them trying to like capture all of this, why it's going on. And I mean, at that point, you know, for us, because we're so focused in on the basketball camps, like we're not really thinking that, you know, these guys need to like, they need to record this and like understand like, you know, their needs as a, as a filming crew. You know, I got, I got a lot of it, you know, with Numan Bai, like I saw those guys and he, he's not lying. Like, I mean, for the, for the Argentina documentary, they would, you would, they were the first up in the morning getting their gear ready. And uh, when we were tired, ready to go to bed and lay down and take a second, you know, they were out there, you know, um, you know, moving the film into different drives and getting ready for the next day and picking their equipment. I mean, they were doing probably about two to four extra hours that we were doing every single day. And so, um, you know, it was just amazing work from everybody. And, um, you know, for, for the Belize documentary, I, I, I don't think uh, the only the reason why I propose to get it done. So I can't say that I, I chose like uh, I was directed to do it. I, I asked for it to be done and I just felt like uh, it was it was a compelling story to tell. And um, and then for uh, for Argentina, I agreed to be a part of uh, of Argentina because uh, I just thought it was I thought it was a great idea. I, I've always felt like there, there should be something like this because because we are in so many different countries of the world and there's so many amazing stories in all these different countries. You know, I, I thought that it was a great opportunity. And, you know, part of visiting the country is also getting to see their culture and stuff. And so I'm really glad that he wanted to, like, kind of bring in aspects of, like, the food and the architecture and the people. And then also, like, you know, you know, still, still tell the, tour, the story of the spread of the song. Yes, I think for in, in regards of preparations, it was uh, just more the administrative for the logistic preparations because as Mamun Saab, I was in constant touch with him, communication, but the challenge was just they were here for a small period. It was like, I think that's five or six days. And we had to also travel to different city uh, uh, 
on 12 hours distance. So to get this everything done in a time period of four or five days, I think that was the only challenge. And then also getting in the different activities we have or to also present the different persons, our contacts, our members. So I think it was just this was the logistically or the administrative part. Other than this, um, the idea was uh, not to prepare from my side nothing or like to present it more natural, you know, as it's uh, as my everyday routine life. So in this, uh, apart from this, there was no other preparation from my side. You, you did so much. You did so much, man. He had food ready for us. He, he fed us. He drove us. He had everything prepared for us, like everywhere we went. Like, I mean, it was a, it was an amazing experience. Like, and and he doesn't have, you know, Marwanvai doesn't have that support there either. You know, it's it's him and his wife and, you know, and like and he did this as an individual. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was amazing what he was able to do, like as, as a solo person. Uh, so moving on from what you agree why you agreed to do these projects uh what were some of the challenges that you encountered while working on them so asif Saab, please start um one of the main challenges looking back now was the fact that because like i said we arrived and how uh, brother norman was saying that you sh usually with documentary filmmaking you make pre preparations beforehand the script is done beforehand um your cast list but because when you arrived in belize and I didn't know much about the league, much about what the camps were about at the time until we actually arrived. Um, we had to hit the ground running. Um, so like Brother Jamil was saying, was one player was saying that um, sometimes we had to record interviews while some of the matches were going on um, because it's just a one-man crew, it's just like one camera. Just while we we're filming the interviews, we could have missed something, you know, in one of the matches or while we we're getting some B-rolls in the matches, um, one of the interviews would have left. So one interesting happened something really funny happened actually, which was with, um, we were interviewing Shine, Shine Burrow, um, who is the son of the prime minister of the country, also a former um, Grammy nominated musician, rapper. Um, so we had a chance to interview him um, at one of the camps. Um, but it so happened um, that when we were interviewing the first time around, there were some technical difficulties, something went wrong and um, I think I had my mind set on the final game was going on at the same time as well. Um, so, you know, by the grace of Allah, um, what we managed to do was go back to Shine and say, can we please record it again? It was a bit embarrassing at the time because it seemed like we were, you know, a bit amateurs turning up, you know, we're filming this guy who's I'm sure he's had many media coverage over the years. Um, but yeah, so things like that did happen. Um, but we took it on our strides. Um, like I said, we had great help. Uh, brother James Sinclair was uh, amazing. Um, he wasn't part of the production crew initially, um, but he helped a lot. Um, so he should have been here today, actually. Um, but yes, so that was one of the challenges we faced. Um, one key thing over the years I've learned is that sound is very important, um, something which I've always undermined previously. Um, but you notice that you can have the most amazing shots, the most amazing B-rolls, beautiful scenery, um, amazing interview. Uh, but if the sound is terrible, what would happen is you you lose your audience. So that's one thing we have to learn from that trip. Uh, so, you know, um, Yusuf was also mentioning just, you know, we, we had to make sure that we were doing a lot of due diligence during this trip uh, in, in terms of all the data that we were collecting, all the film that we were shooting. Uh, each night we had to make sure that, you know, we were double backing up everything. Uh, just so that, you know, we make sure that everything is secure. Um, other than that, it was just, you know, like I said before, we just had to, you know, maintain our energy levels because it's it's very difficult when, when you're constantly, uh, you know, moving around with a lot of gear. And a lot of the times we were walking in different parts of the city. So um, it was just very important for us to sort of, you know, work as a team. Um, and and Unser and I were always sort of, you know, uh, trying to be on the same page and, and looking for direction from a moon bay. Uh, but other than that, um, I think if you have a good team, um, and you're going into these remote countries and you're trying to produce any sort of story, uh, it, became, it becomes a lot easier that way. Yusuf I'm sorry, what's the question? Were there any challenges that you encountered while working on this project? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but that's, I mean, like, nothing's blessed unless there's a struggle in it, right? So... I mean, everything from funding, getting the money for it, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of money. So, I mean, 
I think at the very, honestly, like we were doing, uh, we got permission to crowdsource and we were still short. And just this, this, you know, this brother came out of nowhere and he goes, I like that you guys have actually like, you know, took like a concept and like put it to action. He's like, here's the rest of the money you need. Right. And it was, it was things like this all along, you know, I mean, Asabai was incredibly busy, so he couldn't edit for a while, right? Because he was running, he was running MTA Canada studios, right? So we could, we didn't know how to get the film edited. Um, I mean, Argentina is just now coming out. Like this has been two years in the making. So like there, there's been struggles all along the way, but like, uh, that's kind of been part of the journey. That's what's made it such a such a, a, a fun. It's been it made the experience all the much all that more better and blessed. Like, uh, but yeah, there, there's definitely been struggles, but we, we alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I mean, we overcame them. I think one thing I would add that I think Noman Pai and the Argentina crew was really lucky to have Mamun Rashid Sahin. Um, his vision, as in in hindsight, if we had someone like him with us, who could actually you know oversee everything and organize everything i think things will go much smoother um again i'm not sure why he's not here it'd be great to have a chat with him too because i think overall his vision for any future documentaries as well i think he's worked on some amazing stuff so we're watching the argentina documentary right now i can see how um how you know the filming was so great and how it was overall it came together so well so well done to the team the one well done i shall know Chisaco and Argentina, as well as Belize, are both very well done documentaries and raise the level for MTA documentaries, definitely. So is there a particular shot or a scene that you were really proud of while filming these projects? And for our cast members, um, was there a moment that you were very proud of? while working on these projects? I guess I, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, you know, um, the whole documentary, I had a very good experience. I you know, remember everything. Everything was very memorable to me. But if I was to sort of just choose two things that really, really stood out to me, um, the first thing would be that I was very impressed with um, Ravan Saab's, uh, you know, hard work that he had done over the year and the progress that he had made with, you know, learning the language from scratch and making connections with new people and then also teaching them Arabic in, 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 a, in a Spanish language. That was, uh, I was really impressed by that and, and very awestruck. And the second uh, scene that really stood out to me was uh, when we were recording the uh, interview of uh, Brother Santiago in, in the mission house and uh, he had uh, recited Surah Fatiha. And uh, that really, it, it really, I still remember it to this day. And while watching the documentary again right now, I, I just remember the feeling I had and just, looking at him reciting Surah Fatiha and it just, you know, it was just coming straight from his heart and it's something that, you know, I just kind of uh, remember all the time. Jazakallah. Asif Saab? Go ahead. Or Osman Saab. Um, no. uh, There's a scene where um, it's, it's it's really small, but um, Asif Bai caught it and it got included in the documentary. It's, um, myself and a couple of the coaches just embracing other coaches when we get into gyms. This was something because we hit so many locations, but uh, I think it was in the documentary where I'm embracing them, dapping them up and then asking them, hey, can you serve with us? We're about to do a camp. And these are either either their coaches um, or they're also players that played on either the pro teams in those in those localities or the, the 18 and up age group. And I just thought it was it was really unique to get that into the documentary because at the end of the day, that's what it was all about. Our goals were to give them some structure with these camps, but to also serve alongside them, and which is what happened in a lot of these camps. And I think that year or the year after, they were even driving with us. We had a couple players and coaches driving with us to all these locations. And I think that was the thing uh, for us, but just to drop that knowledge to them, give them that structure to serve and serve along with them. But I thought those scenes were cut Nice well, and that's, that was memorable on my end. I think the scene you're referring to, that was the only scene where <laughs> we actually mic'd up Brother Osman. <laughs> that was the only time we managed to give him a mic. I think the rest of the tour, we just completely forgot. So luckily we captured that at the time. Um, but in terms of memorable scenes, uh, like Brother Norman was saying that it's actually, we're documentary makers. We Our job is only to capture what's going on. We don't make the events happen. The actual hard work is done by people like Imam Marwan Sahib in Argentina and people like Imam Naveed in Belize. And all we do is just capture what they're doing, right? As in, 
Um, and luckily, alhamdulillah, we get to capture some of the good stuff by chance. So, for instance, one of, the, one of my completely unplanned, to be honest, most of the documentary was unplanned, but one of the things which was completely unplanned was the event that happened at night um, when we were driving back from Punta Gorda uh, back to Belize City, which I think was about five, 600 miles distance. And halfway through, the car started to break down. And it was a nerve, to be honest, if I'm looking back now, I would say that it, it, we were in a very dangerous area and anything could have happened. Um, we lost, um, we separated from our, you know, there was a car flow going and we kind of got separated from the rest of the other cars. So we were by ourselves. Um, but I don't know, you know, in those situations, I guess as a any documentary maker, you kind of get excited as well. You think, okay, this is good. This is good for TV. Um, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm just going to document what we have. Um, and so luckily I had the camera rolling um, and we managed to capture some of the stuff. And to be honest, um, that also, although we were really tired the next few days after that, experiences like that really boost your faith as well. You think that, you know, ultimately this is um, this was our intention here was to was for the purpose of God. And sometimes Allah takes care of things in ways that you can't even imagine. And that was a live experience we had, which, you know, to the people with us at the time um, really gave us a boost. So, yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes. Jazakallah. Naman says. I, I think I had answered the question already, but uh, I was, uh, I, I think uh, Yusuf Saab will go next. Yes. You know, my, my, I'd say, you know, there's so, there's so many amazing scenes in these documentaries and, and I, 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 you know, um, you know, Hiva I, I really agree that like, you know, both these filmmakers have really kind of set a new standard for, for documentary making. And I mean, I'm not just saying this for myself. It's, it's been kind of my feedback from a lot of people that I respect as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm just so amazed at the work that they've done, mashallah. Um, with Belize documentary, one of my favorite scenes is it's, it's me, Usman, and, and Khalim Bai sitting together, and we're, we're talking and organizing, and you could you could tell that like we had really great chemistry, and especially in a time now, whenever we're so divided, and like it feels like media and every power that is, is like like they're not. They're, I mean, it's almost like they they want us to become more more divided, you know, with like kind of the message that they're spreading and what they're putting on media, and it just kind of goes to show what happens when we work together. You know, you had a, you had a, a white man, a black man, and a brown man, and we came together. And like none of that mattered because we were we, we took that energy and we focused on something good, right? Instead of just being upset. And so and that's one of my favorite scenes from uh, from the the Belize documentary. But like also, you know, of course the car scene's amazing. I mean, I don't know if it's in the documentary, but like they get picked up on Ulla Street. You know what I mean? Like, like what in Belize? I mean, like, I was just gonna say that. I was just gonna say that. And what are the chances? Um, <laughs> I didn't want to say because I wasn't entirely sure. So did I misread that? Um, but yeah, <laughs> we got picked up on a road which was. It's actually called Allah Street, and what are the chances? Belize isn't even a remotely Muslim country. Um, I still don't know to this day why the road was called Allah Street. Was it actually called Allah Street, or are we just yes, it's Allah Street? I could send you the okay. GPS coordinates of it. Daniel sent it to me a couple of times, but it's it's Allah Street. And you know, uh... what? Daniel, brother Daniel Buter is another key key person who really helped. Um, he was from a separate team, so he came representing from um, MK USA. So he came from the USA team. His primary objective was to capture more of the still images side, um, but he's also a videographer. So some of the things he filmed, which really came in handy later on in the editing process, because like Brother Yusuf was saying, when we got separated with the different cars, they were in a different part of the country and we were in a different part of the country as well. So I managed to get some clips from him. Um, I also managed to get some clips from him when, for instance, when we're filming the interviews and all of a sudden you hear the cow crowd cheering behind you and you think, oh no, we missed something good. Right, and obviously it's, it's too late by then. You can't really turn the camera around. You can't tell your guests, like, can you wait? So I would continue rolling, but luckily um, going back to him really helped because he managed to capture some of the really good action footage as well. And I think you can see some of his um, show reel on YouTube. Um, and I'll let you know, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you up. No, it's okay, thank you. I, I definitely want to talk about Daniel and his team later. I, I know that I noticed one, I, I noticed one of your questions uh, regarding that, but I would say, I mean, for the Argentina documentary, I was like, well, first of all, like, I mean, I, for everybody listening, like, a lot of those, like, breathtaking shots, like, those are original shots that Numan by, uh, that Numan by, and, uh, that he caught. And, uh, they're, they're not, like, they're not stock photography. They didn't purchase those images, like, like, you know, like the, the, the flower opening up and, you know, the time lapses and stuff. That's all original shots. And, like, I mean, they are so good. Like, they could sell them as stock uh, videography, right? Like, it is, I mean, I, they, they were breathtaking shots for sure, mashallah. 
And um, I also, uh, and of course, I, I, when I look back at it, I love chatting with Moran Bai, you know, like, you know, the uh, the end scene whenever, like, we're cracking jokes and stuff, you know, like, Moran Bai, that's really how Moran Bai is all the time. He's a really personable guy. You can see why he's been so successful in Argentina. People just naturally gravitate to him. He's that type of person. And so, you know, kind of like sitting there drinking coffee on the bench and stuff, it kind of made me wish that uh, I could go have another coffee with Moran Bai. Okay. Shazakallah. Uh, Marwan Saib? I would, I would completely agree and join in with uh, Yusuf Saab. And not only coffee, Yusuf, I would say, let's have a barbecue <laughs> um, with all the crew. <laughs> um, so I think uh, for me also, so I think the, the memories especially I have was that, um, especially Yusuf Saab, but also the whole crew, how they built the natural chemistry with the people we interviewed. So I was quite nervous because there was a language barrier. And also, I didn't know how the members are going to react. Because obviously we as born and raised up Ahmadis, we don't need time. It's a natural uh, family, it's a natural brotherhood. But I was worried about our members, how they're, they were already like just a few months being an Ahmadi and how they're going to react, if they're going to adapt this chemistry or not. And I think the credit goes to the crew and especially Yusuf Saab, that uh, if I look back at the documentary, and it was in, in also apart from these scenes, to see the natural chemistry, for example, he had with Santiago, he had with Gonzalo, and also the other other people. So I think um, definitely these are the nice or the, the the best shots, for example, which I remember was his interview with Santiago, and there was a huge language barrier. Also with Alejandro from radio, from the radio channel, he also didn't understand uh, almost uh, nothing of English, but how they built the chemistry, and you could see there was a personal touch. Or for example, for me, especially a remarkable uh, scene is where he teaches to Alejandro saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So I think these are one of uh, very all my favorite uh, shots or scenes. Yes, those were very great scenes in those documentaries. Um, so Asif Saib, while editing, how did you select which stories would be part of your final documentary. I mean, there must have been a lot of footage that you had to go through. So just cutting it and putting it together, how did you select who would have what story in your documentary? So the editing process was extremely difficult, um, mainly because uh, we didn't script anything beforehand. So majority of the times we kept the camera rolling constantly. So the tour was, correct me if I'm wrong, brother Yusuf, was that the tour was for two weeks or 10 days? Um, around that time, right? About, yeah, about, I'd say about, it, was about, it was about 10 days. So 10 days, we were constantly rolling. We were just filming anything and everything. And, you know, in hindsight, you should always shoot to edit. Most of the time, you want to do a quick edit. But because we didn't know exactly what we could capture, we had no script in mind. We had nothing in mind at the time. So we were just filming anything and everything. So we thought once we get back into the post-production suite, um, we can filter through those. So that was a, you know, a nightmare, to be honest, because there's so much... We literally had easily 30 hours of content, which we had to squeeze into a initially a half an hour documentary, which was got, which luckily we had the chance to extend it to an hour. Um, so the way we selected it was we had a lot of content we could have included. Um, one of the ones I do look back and say I wish I did I could somehow squeeze it in was um, brother Kamar Nunes. He took myself and James Sinclair to one of the roughest part of um, Belize, which I it did include briefly in the documentary, but compared to what we filmed, we were there for a whole day. In fact, the in most majority of the afternoon we were there, um, but we only put in about 30 seconds of that drive. But where he took us was, he took us to a part, the only thing I can compare it to was, if you've seen the film Training Day um, with Denzel Washington, um, he goes to a really rough neighborhood in South Central LA, um, which I think they refer to as the jungle. Um, Coincidentally, in Belize, they also refer to this place as a jungle. Um, so we went into that area. Um, we were filming. We constantly kept the camera rolling. Brother Kamal Nunes, who's a convert, um, native to Belize. Um, he was approaching people. He was speaking to people. Um, you'd get a small glimpse of it in the trade, um, in the opening intro, where you see this lady um, demanding from the government, saying that, I want my jungle fixed. Um, she's wearing a dungaree. So we actually filmed there for at least almost a day um so looking back now i wish i had somehow squeezed it in but to be honest the reason i couldn't include it because it was kind of taking away from the overall story um you'd go into a different tangent um so we had to decide and and any editor would you know you'd know it's very difficult to make their decisions sometimes 
Um, we missed out on a very key interview of Brother Omar Akbar, who is also a missionary in Belize. Um, I was planning to do his interview, and by the time we finished coming back from Mexico, we just didn't get a chance. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult decision sometimes you have to make. Um, but Alhamdulillah, it came together, I think. Jazakallah. Um, Naman Saheb, you were a director of photography for Argentina, and as DOP, you're responsible for the style and bringing the director's vision to life. So how did you work with Mamun Rashid Saheb in making that happen? So, you know, uh, before we, we went to Argentina, we had a discussion with Mamun Bai and Ansar as to, you know, how we wanted to sort of film the documentary and what sort of styles we were we were going after so you know as i mentioned before you know documentary filmmaking is not just about the aspect of turning the camera on and, and just starting to record there's a whole plan of action that you need to uh sit down with your team and, and come up with before you you get on site so uh there were you know plenty of examples that we were taking looks at um in terms of you know the different documentary styles that are out there and uh we sort of we were all on the same page before we arrived at argentina so um, and 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 while we were shooting the documentary, we were reviewing our footage every day, so just to make sure that it was in line with, you know, the story, that, the overall story that we we're trying to tell, and also in line with the vision that you know Mamoun Bai had while he was writing the script. Jazakallah. So, what were there any shots when you were on location that you had to refilm the next day, or were there any problems that you faced? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you do have to retake shots, uh, you know, at the end of the documentary, there's a small loop, looper reel and, uh, you know, Marwan Sa was saying, you know, they're going to ask us to reshoot this scene. So sometimes, you know, you do run into scenarios where, you know, the lighting changes on you or you get some sort of audio interferences with, you know, the wireless microphones we're using. So, you know, there were very few scenes that we did have to reshoot. But overall, um, because we had two cameras that were on site, we were always sort of you know, saving each other. If if for some reason one camera was not able to capture the angle that was desired, we had a backup camera that you know was was always there, and we were always recording. So so um, we had minimal sort of circumstances where we had to reshoot um, overall, just because we were well prepared for it. Jazakallah. And Asif Saab, was there anything that you had to reshoot on your documentary? Um, yes, first of all, the documentary is Shine. Um, I'm actually glad Brother James isn't on here because he would have slated me for it. <laughs> um, that was one we had to reshoot. But the second one was an interview with um, Brother Naveed, Imam Naveed Mangla. Um, we didn't get a chance to, if you look at the, most of the documentary, um, like I said, most of it was unscripted. Well, one thing I tried to do was near the end of our tour, once the camps had finished, after we captured whatever we just kept on rolling on camera, um, I tried to navigate through some of the content by sitting with the, uh, some of the cast members and getting interviews in hindsight. Um, so we'd ask them a question and say, can you tell us about that moment when this happened and this moment when that happened? Um, unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to do that with Nabeed Pai. Um, we did have an attempt initially where the lighting was extremely difficult to control because we had no lighting. Um, we just had a reflector. And if you're not shooting during the golden hours, it can be really harsh on me. So luckily, Nabeed Pai visited London for Jelsa 2018, um, at which point I managed to capture in the Fuzzle Mosque. So it was a bit of a cheat. Um, I don't think the viewers could work out exactly where he was because where we composed a shot was in the, at the back garden um, of the Fuzzle Mosque uh, complex. Um, so we managed to get his um, retrospect perspective from there. So that was the only second thing we had to reshoot. Wow, I would never have guessed that that's Fuzzle Mosque, and I've watched that <laughs> documentary several times, but never. And you helped with the script, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yusuf Sahib, we have a question for you in the chat. Uh, the comment about Mayans being wiped out because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So, what do you mean by this? As historically, they weren't exposed to teachings at the time. Well, you know, well, one. I you know, I, I remember when asked if I was asking me this question at the time, you know, I was really kind of having trouble, like finding the words that I wanted to use to kind of uh, explain like my feeling at the moment. And like, it was not, that was not a planned shot. That was, that was an excursion for us. You know, that that's something that's wrong with Belize is that there are, 
you know, there are Mayan ruins all over the country of Belize. I mean, and we're finding more and more. Actually, that that particular site was just found recently by some Canadians. They they pretty much just looked and said that's not a hill, and of course, underneath it was uh, it was pyramids. But um, I, I mean, it's a little bit of an inference, but you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, wa ma ahlakna min koriyatin illa laha mundirun, right? And never did we destroy a township, but it had warners. And I, I, I don't know, I, I, and I give this to you very loosely, right? But you should look at, I would, for the question, I think it was Seda and then another gentleman. Um, look at Graham Hancock's work. Uh, he, he, I mean, you're not going to like the title of this book, but it's called The Fingerprints of the Gods. And uh, there is like some historical documents of there being these very peculiar people. They called them civilization bringers in the region. And uh, they, were, they were tall white men with like uh, reddish beards. And uh, they, they were pretty much telling them, please stop doing human sacrifices. You know, here are some things that you shouldn't do. And here's how you become civilized as a community and a people. And they brought like moral teachings to these people that were going to be beneficial for their society. So I kind of beg to differ. I think there is. I think there is some, uh, you know, one week we can refer that God says that he doesn't. He doesn't and this isn't the only reference in the Quran. I mean, it's pretty much a commandment of Muslim, Muslims to travel into the earth and see the people that have been destroyed before. And you would really be hard pressed to kind of go into a region and not find like a civilization that, you know, there's not much left of them, you know, and and with the Mayan, it, you know, it's it's not really like very well documented. Everything that's kind of taken place. I mean, because of new, uh, I guess, uh, radar technology, we're finding out that they were much bigger and larger than we ever thought they were. They were people most likely millions of people. So I don't know. I I we agree to disagree. And if, and if I've hurt anybody's feelings, it was not my intention. I was just. At the moment, I just I, did, I hadn't prepared anything. I didn't think that um, that I was going to have to speak on praying on the pyramid. Um, so my apologies if I've heard anybody's feelings. JazakAllah. Um, Imam Sahib, there is a question for you as well. Uh, what is the current situation of the Argentina community? And is there any activity from the women's side? So Alhamdulillah, at the moment, we have um, more than 20 members. Um, and the second part about Legina or women's organization, Alhamdulillah, also by this moment, um, the Legina um, Auxiliaries uh, organization has also been established in Argentina. And just recently, for example, the 8th of March, which is celebrated as International Women's Day, so our Jamaat, um, organized by our Legina's, uh, we organized our interreligious faith dialogue with uh, eight different representatives of different religions which shows that also our uh, legends, alhamdulillah, are very well established also in interfaith or intercultural uh, events and platforms. And it was held under a review of religions in um, the Spanish section. So also a part of this, obviously, the legends have their uh, tablih, tarbiyat sessions. Also, for example, now during the pandemic, they distributed uh, face masks to different hospitals. So uh, despite of being uh, very small numbers, Alhamdulillah, uh, our Lajnas are very active. Uh, Usman Saib, we'll start with you on this next question. Um, after watching Belize in basketball and for the rest of our panel, that means the undiscovered continent as well, uh, what do you want the audience to come away with after watching the documentary? Um. I think when Asif Bay had interviewed me towards the end of that trip, and I think it's in the documentary, um, I was reflecting back then that I think that was still my the goal and mission was uh, to come away with that if you have a desire to serve, that the world is ready and the world is in need, and if you have uh, if you have any niche, if you're good at anything, um, run with that passion and serve with that passion. And I said it in there is I, we were just blessed with that opportunity. We all enjoy sports. We all obviously love to serve. And through the community and through the blessings of the Prophet of Sayyid al-Islam, we were able uh, to put it all together with the missionaries. That just how it came together after writing those letters that Azur is just like the use of it. And as I said, it just it, everything comes about. Yeah, we have challenges, but it all comes together. Um, you just need that need and desire to serve, and that's what I would love to come out of out of this documentary is inspiration to others to 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 get it going. Asif Saib, would you like to add on? 
Um, I guess the key key message to take away from both documentaries, and I think it sounds a bit of a cliche, but it's just the blessings of Ahmadiyyat, how it brings people together. Um, just to give you an example, right now, Brother Osman is in a Middle Eastern country at the moment. I don't want to expose which country he is in case he gets in trouble. Um, so he's in the Middle East somewhere right now. So it's about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, Brother Yusuf, I believe uh, he's either on the way to Vancouver or he's in Vancouver at the moment, which is another side of the world. And if it wasn't for these documentaries, um, I don't see how people from so many different backgrounds and locations and myself from Europe, originally from Bangladesh, um, how would we even come together to, you know, produce that content? So I think the take home message is how both these documentaries kind of displays how it brings people together. Um, first of all, nationally within the countries we went to and internationally all around um, as well, um, which is a blessing. Um, and it shows, only goes to show um, how far Ahmadiyyat has reached. Um, one of the documentaries we watched was the Gandhi documentary as well in Benin. Um, I never knew that place even existed. Uh, so yes, well, that's what, that's one of my key key home take messages, to be honest. Jazakallah, Yusuf Sahib. Are you still in Vancouver, Yusuf Sahib? Or are you I'm, there yet? Sorry. You know, I, I'm sending me to Michigan. I'm, I'm in uh, Auburn Hills, Michigan. Uh, which oh, is mashallah, a, US. It's a suburb of Detroit. And yes. so I, I'm, I'm here training for work. Um, you know, you know, one thing definitely is, and, and it was my tension from the very beginning, and it was it was actually kind of a reason I, I did, you know, initially I didn't want to be in Belize in basketball. Is I wanted for the youth to see people that that I wanted to the inspire, right? Like the youth of our community. I really believe that within our within our our, our, our religious community, within our Jamaat, there's a lot of very talented young people. I mean, way more talented and intelligent than I am. I mean, just like, I'm just amazed uh, at meeting some of these people. And I, I think that I, I wanted to kind of like be able to put something out there and be like, look, you guys can do way better than this. And so I've, I've kind of noticed something about myself is like, when I when I do something, it tends like people are like, hey, I can do better than that, right? And I was really hoping to get that response uh, from this generation. I hope it inspires uh, people to come and outstrip this and do better and, and set a new bar. Um, and the, that was kind of the intention behind a, a lot of this stuff. So I hope I hope that it's done that, and that it's made people like think differently. Like there's a lot of I really like the content that we have on MTA currently, but I think that there is room for us to like to venture out into new genres. Um, you know, like uh, you know, because if if we're watching Netflix, like we're not winning. You know, guys, like uh, our content should be there too. And I think that what we proved is we can definitely make that type of content. And the other side too is like if you haven't recorded, it's almost like it hasn't been done. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. These stories are abundant in the world. You know, Asabai, you know, he's told so many of these. He can speak to this even more than I can. You know, he's traveled the world telling these stories. And like, no matter where you go, like you have this miraculous stories. And uh, you know, I, I just I would like to see more of it. I mean, we hear about it and we see it, right? But like, uh, you know, you know, the art of a documentary is storytelling, right? It's, it makes it it's, it's a little bit more engaging. So that that, that was the other side of it. I think, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind uh, addressing this question is, you know, the promise besides revelation, I shall cause that message to reach the corners of the earth. You know, we just saw four documentaries that were amazingly done. They were shot in different parts of the world. And we're just seeing this message being broadcasted, you know, on all corners. And and I think from here, it's just going to accelerate even more. It's going to build on itself. And and these sort of documentaries, they they, they you know, they help you know, help the community understand what's happening in different parts of the world, but also, you know, it broadcasts, you know, to other cultures and other communities, you know, that this community is growing and this is the true, you know, message of Islam. And and I think these sort of projects are, are amazing and they should continue to accelerate. And uh, I think it's just, uh, like I said, it's just going to accelerate and grow from here. Jazakallah. Imam Saif? I think also uh, I would go along the lines of Nomansa. I think it's a it's a huge blessing to be able and to live at this uh, moments or era where you can uh, physically be far away, but you can be part of other jamaats and see how God is blessing Himself and supporting them. Be it now Belize or other South American countries or um, remote jamaat in different parts of the world. So I think in this uh, we should take advantage of MTA and use it as an instrument to show also and share the blessings of God with this divine community and especially the blessings of Khilafat. Um, and I think it's a it's a great 
prophecy also through MTA becoming uh, being fulfilled, where it says uh, when people are gonna become uh, closer or brought together. So who could have imagined? Uh, now people, alhamdulillah, by this work of our crews, being in Belize or Argentina, being in Asia, Africa or Europe, uh, being physically far away, but they're gonna be part of our Jamaat, they're gonna pray for us. And I think that's one of the blessings and I think uh, where we have a lot of work also to continue to do this. Jazakallah. So for Asif Sahib and for all of you, um, one question we have is, are you currently working on or do you have other projects in mind? So Asif Sahib, we'll start with you. Um, yes. So I am currently working on a documentary based in Bangladesh. So in just before the lockdown last year in 20, end of 2019, um, I was sent by Beloved Hazur to go review the studios. We did regular visits usually, and we went back. Um, I was there for three months um, with the team. It's an excellent team, amazing team. Um, so I sound like Donald Trump right now, but it, they're, they're a brilliant, brilliant team, to be honest. Um, and they were they're saying that we should do, you know, we should travel around the country as well. And one thing, just to give you context of the documentary, was um, Khalifa al Musi al Arabi, um, before his Khilafat, he had traveled extensively around Bangladesh. And I remember growing up, I used to hear his stories of he went this, like he went to the Sundarban jungles, he went to the Silet area. And I always wanted to do a documentary which I could follow on those footsteps um, because I had an excellent team. You know, they gave us the confidence to travel. And we went and we filmed the southeast corner of the country, um, which is I'm working on at the moment. Um, it's overdue, to be honest. Um, I have a tendency of um, taking too long editing stuff sometimes. So I'm working on that at the moment. And hopefully we should have it released by Jal Salih Singh, inshallah. Jazakallah. Naman Sahib. Uh, can you just repeat the question for me? I had, uh, had cut off for me. All right. Uh, are you currently working on or do you have other projects in mind that you'll be working on in the future? So, you know, the Argentina documentary is, is, is a pilot documentary that, that we have shot and, and filmed. And um, the, the purpose of this documentary is, you know, that there was a desire to show the, the new murabis that are being deployed in, in, you know, South America and they're establishing these communities. So um, the goal is to, you know, travel into different South American countries and film and document how the Jamaat is being established over there and how it's growing over there. So the documentaries that will come after this will sort of, you know, be in, in a sort of similar fashion. And, uh, and, and, and uh, that's, that's what the goal is. Jazakallah. Yusuf Saib? Um, I mean, as, as Namambai has said, uh, there, there's definitely been talks at uh, MTA Canada about doing like some follow-ups, you know, Paraguay and, and Bolivia. And there's a couple of countries that they're doing a lot of amazing things as well that uh, we, we'd like to go. And uh, Asifai and I have been talking about a follow-up to uh, Belize in basketball. I, I just don't think we've got permission yet. So I don't want to spill the beans yet, but like uh, it's definitely, definitely in my heart for sure, inshallah. Jazakallah. Usman Sahib? Um, sure. I think the first camps we ever did service-wise, uh, I think Daniel Buder's name was brought up. He's actually done a documentary on this. It's called Urban Youth Basketball Camps. We were focusing on inner cities. That was in Racine, Wisconsin. And there's um, our core team has emailed. Um, this was like right when COVID kicked in last year, around April, May. We all had this urge to to plan something for the summer. Um, so we, we had this whole email drafted to Amir Saab USA saying that we really want to take what we our successes of Belize and service, and with the the BLM movement going on, and, and the atrocities that they're dealing with and have been dealing with for decades. We wanted to really hit a lot of more inner cities in America, and uh, Amir Saab approved it. But at the same time, he was just like, uh, you know, asked for a budget. Uh, we sent that to him and everything. So it's just kind of all frozen and on hold with starting playing with COVID. Uh, another project we have going um, with Yusuf's um, <laughs> prayers and blessings is uh, Ghana. And Hazur has approved that one. Um, I think Ghana reached out to us and they saw uh, the Belize documentary and they, 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 they feel a need with basketball out there. And again, that's just... And on the back burner right now with COVID, but Ghana doing camps, inshallah. I think the next documentary I work on, I definitely have to get 
brother was small to voice over it. I think it's got a perfect <laughs> narrator's voice, the perfect amount of bass. So yes, that's the next project coming along, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Imam Sahib, what about you? No, I mean, like, I, I, I won't be able to travel around or to leave. Uh, so <laughs> I'm stuck in Argentina. <laughs> uh, but uh, obviously, I hope that now after uh, being part of this documentary and inshallah when the pandemic is over, hopefully we're going to receive more brothers or uh, coming over for doing the Fayarzi or also more visitors, inshallah. And also, <laughs> obviously, who is always invited, Yusuf, Noman, and also Asa Sab, Usman Sab. Exactly. Well, they come also to do bas basketball camps. Not, uh, camps might be a difficult, but we could do football camps. So there's an invitation for everyone to come over for a second part. You know, I'm, a, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Maradona, by the way. So I'd love to at least come and do some, you know, Cobra Zodiac or something. <laughs> Definitely more than welcome. And obviously, always with a barbecue, barbecue and oh, coffee. Yes. You know, when I saw the barbecue yeah. show in the documentary, and because I'm a avid, you know, my wife will tell you this, my avid meat eater. So when I saw that, I was like, oh man, I wish, I wish I got to go on that trip. So it looked <laughs> lovely. Jazakallah. Uh, so our final question, and this is for all of you. Uh, what advice would you give to our aspiring documentary filmmakers and especially females who would like to get in in filmmaking? So I'll start with you, Asif Saib. Um, I think, honestly speaking, as in anyone can go into documentary, documentary filmmaking, and I'll give an example. It's all about having a story. So my background, uh, my degree is in biology. I'm from a biomedical background. Um, I've always enjoyed, the only reason I got into this is basically I've been in MTA since 99, and I've always seen people, you know, run around cameras, and the blessings you have with MTA is you get to meet a lot of people from different countries. And so I've always been curious to tell stories of people's lives. And I think that's the key thing with documentary filmmaking. Um, the key thing is to be able to tell stories or have that curious mind to understand how people live, why people do what they do, um, and just sticking a camera in their face. It's not essentially about the art of it as much. Um, so for instance, you could have the most amazing drone footage. You can have the most amazing shot of a nice time lapse, an amazing grand view of you know scenic sunset going on but if you don't have a story to go with that it just becomes like a what do you do with that footage it just becomes like a screensaver right so ultimately what you need to do is nowadays thanks to the developments and with technology um so the phone i'm on right now has a better quality um uh, potentially better quality camera than the camera i used to film believes with right so nowadays you can even film anything with any, with a phone um, as long as you have a story. So look for the stories to tell, and especially, um, I'll be obviously a bit biased, uh, especially coming from an Ahmadi background. Um, we have so many stories to tell. And if you listen to Hazul's Friday sermons, um, he's all, especially during, if you notice the Jalsa speeches on Saturday, he speaks of so many, you know, um, amazing miracles that's taking place in different parts of the world. And I would request that obviously, because we, we can't all go to these places, there's nothing stopping the locals from just capturing these stories, just recording an interview, um, because the story is key. Um, your content could be, your shots can be a shaky, uh, poorly lit, even the audio could suffer, but ultimately it's the story that makes or breaks any film. Um, so I would encourage anyone and everyone to pick up a camera. Um, don't just film it in it, you know, there's so many things like TikTok and all these silly things going around. Have some substance to it, have something that changes people's minds and inspires others. Um, so with the Belize documentary, and at the end, um, I, didn't, I don't know if I did put it in um, Osman Pai when I asked him the question, you know, what's the final take message you have for people watching this documentary? And he was quite emotional at the time because he knew the power of uh, MCA. He knew that someone somewhere in some corner of the world would be watching this. And he, the message he conveyed to those people was like, our objective is only to inspire others. Um, you know, as examples, we show examples of, you know, this is what's happening in this corner of the earth. Why don't you, or give you the confidence to, you know, replicate it in your corner of the earth? So I think he encouraged people, you know, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be basketball, it can be football, um, any story. Um, I, especially nowadays um, with the negative media that's going around with, you know, Islam and Muslims, uh, especially, I think we owe it to ourselves to somehow show the stories of regular Muslims 
um, even an Uber driver who happens to be a Muslim. And I, I'm a genuine believer in this, that I think if I get into a Uber, an Uber, you know, a cab driver who's in the, who happens to be a Muslim, his etiquette, he sometimes stands out from someone else. And we need to highlight this, you know, general Muslims are, you know, they're not terrorists and all these negative things that media makes out from us to be the most loving people. You go to Turkey, you go to Istanbul, you get into, a, you know, you get into um, their cars and the way they receive you. It's definitely a cultural thing. Um, and then a religious element has to come into this. So I would encourage anyone and everyone, don't be scared. Um, I don't know anything about, I never had any formal training with anything. Uh, I think from the beginning of this conversation, I couldn't say anything I've gone into, I've never scripted it properly. Um, but ultimately it's all praise. Um, if your intentions are the right place and have the intention that, you know, Allah, whatever skills you've given me, whatever you want me to be, I'll just be a tool and just use me to convey your message. And somehow, some way, something clicks. Um, not sure if all that made sense, but hopefully someone you can take something away from it. I think that's great advice, especially for people who are starting out in documentaries and at MTA in general. Uh, Naman Saib, what would you like to say? I think uh, Asif Saab gave a wonderful answer and, uh, you know, I'll just resonate what he said. You know, it's all about storytelling at the end of the day, right? Uh, documentary filmmaking, you know, the fil filmmaking is just one aspect of, of what goes on in a documentary. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different aspects that are just as equally important. And, and you know, if, if one aspect is weak, then the whole project becomes weak, right? So, uh, in my opinion, you need to have a very, um, you need to have a very good team that you can re rely on upon each other. Uh, speaking for me personally, I have a I have a technical background, so you know I'm really able to help out with you know some some of the technical requirements. But when it comes to script writing, you know those are not my strengths, right? And you need to have a good writer to be you know part of the team that can come up with a concept of the story, and you need to have good uh, uh, you know people that are able to translate from different languages. Um, you need to have good editors. You know I'm not a very strong editor, so. You know, again, if we never had a good editor, if we never had any good script writers, we never had a good director, the whole project would start to suffer, right? So filmmaking is just one part of the whole project. And uh, in my opinion, you need to have a very good team. And, you know, the same thing goes, you know, it's it's not, it, it doesn't have anything, anything to do with gender. You mentioned, you know, how can women take part of this? I think, you know, the rules are sort of, you know, they apply to everyone the same way. And, uh, and, and if you have a good team to rely upon each other, um, you'll have a very successful project, in my opinion. If I could just add one more thing. Um, so I think, especially for Muslim, Muslim filmmakers who are watching this, um, I think the angle we need to start portraying on TV is not to be so defensive. I think over the years, we've always so busy defending ourselves. We're all so busy answering this allegation and this allegation. And while we're doing that, we kind of forget to promote the positives. Um, we get so caught up in um, always on the back foot that we forget to say that actually Islam promotes this. If, if we adapt to this concept or if we adopted this concept of Islam, I think society here would be so much better than it is now. Um, you touched on uh, what advice would you have for the uh, women or female filmmakers? Um, I think currently the trend that's happening um, recently, that's something that's something terrible has happened in London where this young lady went missing and she was found murdered. And so there's a movement that's coming up saying, you know, the responsibility of men, um, how in the West we're always, you know, if you look at articles after articles, it's talking about um, how women are being harassed and how they can't walk at night safely in the Indian subcontinent. That happens daily. If you look at what's happening in India, some of the stories, horrific stories you hear all the time. So this is where I think um, our sisters out there need to go out and say, you know, Islam has been saying, if you follow X, Y, and Z and you know, principles, you could save ourselves from you know, a lot of trouble. And like I said, because we're so, the media is always hammering us down so much that we're constantly have, we're defending the hijab, we're defending this today, we're defending that, we never go into the positive. And so actually, by the way, the reason we do this and the reason we do that, had we adopted it here, we could have averted the financial crisis in 2008, right, because of the interest. So, so many Islamic um, guidance that if we could highlight, and I think that's what we need to focus on instead of just defending ourselves, let's go out there and say, you know, this is what you should be adapting. And this is why um, from 1500 years of history, when you adapt these principles, um, these are the social fruits you bear. Um, so I think we owe it to ourselves um, to promote that, both brothers and sisters out there. Um, yes. Just to add, just to add one point, uh, I think Imam Saab had mentioned, one of the blessings of these documentaries is people sitting in other parts of the world 
get an opportunity to pray for you. One of the I just saw a powerful documentary the other day from Al Jazeera. They did one on the tunnels of um, the man-made tunnels that were being built by Palestinians going into Egypt, and how this is their only source of food and and water, where they have to dig through these t- with their hands. And it, them capturing those moments um, is powerful, and you know it, it makes you it makes your heart and your soul start praying for those individuals that you would never in- encounter. And I think that could be for future filmmakers is focus on it. Because we're has been saying this, innocent lives matter. And it's like, just take that perspective and find a story which is not being portrayed by the CNNs and the Washington Post and the New York Times. They're, they're all about likes and clicks and, you know, clickbait these days. But the, our focus, I think, should be on touching the hearts and souls that don't get one person out sorry one person uh, for the sisters out there i would um, encourage to watch some of her documentaries dia khan um she made some amazing documentaries where she's interviewed um she's gone into the right wing um right wing um american i'm not sure if you know in the uk we call them bnps and national front in the us they have the right wing uh, white supremacist she's gone into and you know mixed with these people and she's filmed these people to show their perspective at the same time she's gone and interviewed um, some jihadists and her background she says she's from Norway and she says the same thing she she's not a documentary filmmaker she's never studied this um in in the, from the technical aspect of it but she's picked up a camera and she's just gone and started filming I understand there are security concerns sometimes um but I would recommend our sisters out there to watch some of her documentaries which are really inspiring Jazakallah uh, Yusuf Sai, what would you like to add? You know, one thing, uh, and I mean, for any filmmaker, and just like a point to clarify too, is that like in, in every step of doing this, we wrote Azur and asked for his prayers, his guidance, um, his permission. You know what I mean? Like he he has been involved with, you know, every single step of this process from the beginning to the end. And so, um, you know, if you are, if, if there is a young uh, filmmaker out there, you should definitely write as well. Tell them what you, what, you know, um, what you're thinking about doing and request prayers and stuff like, like the, the, please don't let it go down being said that that is what we've been doing all along and meeting with Azura as well and telling him what, what we're planning on doing and, and getting his guidance. Um, and then for, uh, you know, I, I would love that our ladies would make some, some document, not just documentary, social media too. I think that, that that's one, another thing that our ladies would be excellent at. And it's very related to like filmmaking as well. You know, I, when, when we look at, uh, I was just astounded looking, I mean, I know in America, everybody's super educated within our Jamaat, but when you look at Canada and particularly the women are, are, are I, I don't want to say something false, but they're close to being more educated than men in general. We talk about master's degrees and getting doctorates and stuff. So this is naturally going to go, it's, it's going to, there's going to be alignment for sure and i think that they, they should definitely do it and you know with my one of my first teachers he used to say he said if you had a good idea he's like go do it before satan takes it away you know so <laughs> if you have a good idea don't go kick it around don't get everybody's feedback don't everybody have poo-poo on it you know just go do it you know what i mean and don't and, and put those blinders on and like run for the goal and uh and and you know, and, and you and see God's help all along the way, and you'll be amazed at like the miracles that happen, and like the hurdles you're a, uh, you're able to overcome. And um, you know, it's uh, you know, I, I really feel like God's rahimia comes whenever you put all the right ingredients together, right? And and you know, God always blesses your efforts. I find like even whenever I've, I've made things that weren't that great, like He still blessed my effort. But whenever I put all the pieces right in the right order, man, you know, mashallah, He makes like miracles happen and stuff. So, you know, th- that would be my advice to 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 the you know any young filmmaker and, and women especially go do it and, and don't anybody tell you otherwise and also to encourage the Ahmadi sisters out there the belize documentary you watched uh, a huge chunk of it was scripted by sister hibbeth herself and you know uh, documentary making isn't just about filming it's not just about carrying a camera in fact majority of the work takes place behind the scenes and yeah. the script writing you know uh, brother yusuf's wife also helped Tiana Jell's um, sister she was right. there she helped yeah. but, all of our yeah, exactly. And it all comes together. And Sister Hibbert, I'll give an example. Um, recently, by the grace of Allah, we managed to get the documentary on Amazon Prime. And one of the hurdles we kept them facing was that they would keep sending the documentary back. And it wasn't the quality of the filming wasn't the problem with them. Um, it wasn't the story of the, the content wasn't a problem with them. The key thing they kept on picking up constantly was um, the subtitles, the closed captioning. And we just kept on going back and forth, back and forth, kept on getting rejected all the time. And Sister Hibbert, help greatly. Um, so sisters out there, 
you don't have to say, okay, I don't have a camera at the moment, or oh, I'm scared to go out there. You can do a lot of things uh, just by writing a decent script. You can do it with voiceover. You can go online and get stock footage and put something together. So um, this is the only key example I can give you, and it should encourage a lot of people, hopefully. Jazakallah. I think you give me far too much credit for the script writing. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for the kind words. Uh, Imam Sahib, what would you like to say as final words to wrap up? Um, to wrap up, obviously I'm not a professional as the rest of the crew here, uh, not an expert in this field, but I think uh, it is important to remember that uh, it's now our responsibility always to explore new ways. Uh, worldly people use the same platforms, the worldly blessings, the means, but for short time purpose. And Islam does not prohibit you of using them because God says in, in the Holy Quran, He has not He has not creating or everything has created has a purpose, but it's our duty, our responsibility to use it um, in a purpose, in a manner to serve God. So, and if you think about it, the Holy Prophet Muhammad used to explore all the ways, new ways and according to his society. For example, his moment, he wrote letters to different kings to convey the message of Islam. He used to go to different, when the people for Hajj would come together, he would use these opportunities, these gatherings, social gatherings to preach to them. So he would adopt, he would use the same means which were, the means which were established. Then we have the example of Promised Messiah it was the era of writing books, of writing, publishing articles, and he used it in the best possible manner. His books, he used to take the best quality to publish his books, his writings, and would emphasize on this. Now it's the era of um, social media, of videos, of uh, everything has become virtual. So now it's our responsibility, and especially I think I would uh, urge and promote and encourage our Ahmadi brothers and sisters to explore in this regard new ways to convey the essence of Islam, the message of God, of unity, the beauty of Islam, as Asa Saab and all the other brothers said, but in, no, in new ways always, according to the norms, according to the new uh, um, uh, ways of uh, societies or civilizations. But I think there's a need always for us to tell these stories. We have so much content um, which people need outside to listen, to hear that how God is uh, blesses us, how he accepts our prayers on everyday life. And I think in this we have a huge responsibility to get this message out to people um, so they can get inspired and they can find their way to God. And this is also what Huzur has been encouraging us to do. Sorry, just one last thing I just want to quite say about this. Um, Huzur also recently, um, not recently, several times has instructed, especially MTA um, volunteers and workers that we should go out there and the word he used i think is one of the indonesian mulagats he said that we should try and produce diljasp content um for tv for mta um from what i understand from the word diljasp is like quite you know interesting attractive content for mta so it doesn't always have to be boring content um any content would you know try to and somehow include the audience and somehow uh, um, entertain them some way as well because sometimes that's the best way to learn um, lecturing doesn't always work. A video or a picture speaks a thousand words. And this is the guidance of beloved Huzur. May Allah strengthen his hand. And recently in one of the Al-Hakam articles, he gave the guidance as well that our job is only to present the case to the viewers, right? Um, and we have to believe in our um, in our teachings. We have to have the confidence that you know, our t teaching itself is enough just to present it to the viewers. And if there are people out there looking for the truth, um, the people who want to listen, they'll definitely listen. So, again, I can't encourage people enough just to pick up a camera or do anything, just to tell a story, inshallah. Jazakallah. And thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join our discussion, especially as some of you are in different time zones than I am. Um, I'm sure our viewers at home learned a lot, and I especially enjoyed hearing about the scene behind the scenes, even though I've helped out on both documentaries. It was great to hear all of your perspectives as well. Um, before we leave tonight, I would like to remind our dear viewers that we will be reconvening once more tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern for the final screening, and we will be joined by the director and cast of The Golden Rule. So please do join us again tomorrow. And if you have any comments or additional inquiries, please feel free to email us at minaretfilm at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. And you can find us at 
face you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the handle Minaret Film. Uh, once again, thank you so much, and Jazakala to all of you for participating in this discussion. And I hope to see you again tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, and peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you, Hibba Saiba, for putting this together. You did an amazing job. It was an amazing man. You did such a good job. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.